Chapter 45 Sebastian spent the morning in Smithfield looking for Tom. He made no attempt to disguise who he was. He even brought along a couple of strapping footmen to preclude any possibility of a repeat of what had happened on his last visit to the area. But Tom had obviously followed instructions and taken care to blend into his surroundings. Tom found an old woman selling buttons, who said she'd seen a boy about his age running through the streets just before sunset, running like the hounds of hell were after him, but she didn't know what had happened to the lad, or even who'd been chasing him. Sebastian looked for the maimed Scottish soldier who'd been reduced to begging outside the Norfolk Arms, but no one could remember having seen the man for days. Standing in the shade cast by a ribbon shop's awning, Sebastian studied the inn's ancient brick façade, and knew a deep and powerful disquiet. He'd come back at dusk, Sebastian decided, when the creatures of the night were a prowl. Andrew, James, he said curtly. The two footmen snapped to attention as he pushed away from the building. I want you to check every watch house in the area, every watchman, every beadle. Do you understand? Someone must have seen him. Aye, my lord. Leaping up into the carriage, Sebastian slammed his own door and sent the coachman flying to Queen Square, only to learn there that Sir Henry Lovejoy was out pursuing leads on his gruesome park murder. Increasingly frustrated, his temper fraying, Sebastian thought about Tess Bishop's early morning visit and knew how he would spend the remaining hours until dusk. He tracked the Chevalier de Vardon to Angelo's fencing academy in Bond Street, where Vardon was fencing with the master himself. Sebastian stood for a time watching them. The Chevalier was a good swordsman, with a keen eye and flexible wrists, and a quick light step. Barefoot, stripped down to his shirt sleeves and buckskin breeches, he moved effortlessly across the hardwood floor, foil flashing, his light brown hair tumbling in his eyes. Sebastian had never heard anything to the man's discredit. The ladies liked him for his charming manner and graceful step on the dance floor, while the men liked him for his ready laugh and easy generosity and courage on the hunting field. True, the Chevalier was known to have a quick temper, but there was nothing to suggest he was the kind of man who could subject the woman he loved to a slow and painful death by poison. As Sebastian watched, the Chevalier feigned to the left then slipped past the master's guard to land a hit to his shoulder. The master laughed, and the match ended. They stood talking a few moments with the easy camaraderie of two men in love with the same sport. Then Vardon headed for the changing room. Sebastian caught him just inside the door. Locking onto Vardon's right wrist, Sebastian twisted the man's arm in a way that shoved his hand up into the middle of his back and spun him around, throwing Vardon off balance. Sebastian slammed him face first against the wall, Sebastian's left arm coming across the front of Vardon's throat to hold him from behind. You bloody bastard, Sebastian whispered in his ear. The Chevalier tried to turn his head, his eyes rolling sideways. Devlin, what the devil? Sebastian tightened the pressure on the man's throat. You lied to me, he said, enunciating each word slowly and carefully. I know about the arrangement the Marquis of Anglesey had with his wife and I know about your part in it, so don't even think about trying to deny it. Of course I lied to you, Vardon said, his voice strained. What gentleman wouldn't? Sebastian hesitated, then stepped back and let the man go. The chevalier swung around, his dark eyes flashing, his left hand rubbing his other arm. Touch me again and I'll kill you. He went to pour water in one of the basins on the washstand and splashed his face with quick, angry motions. Who told you? he said after a moment. Anglesey? I wouldn't have expected that. He wants me to find his wife's killer. Vardon looked around. Are you suggesting I don't? Their gazes caught and clashed. Sebastian said, Where did you and the Marchioness used to meet? Vardon hesitated, then reached for a towel. Different inns? Usually not the same place twice. Why? Did you ever meet in Smithfield? Smithfield? 
There was surprise in the man's face, but something else, too. Something that almost looked like fear. Good God, no. Why do you ask? Because Guinevere Anglesey went there the afternoon she was killed. You wouldn't happen to know why, would you? His brows drew together. Where in Smithfield? Sebastian simply shook his head. How did you spend last Wednesday? The implications of the questions were obvious. Bardon's nostrils flared. I slept late. I'd been out most of the night before with friends. I didn't even leave the house until around five, maybe six. He paused in the act of pulling on his boots to throw Sebastian a malevolent glare. You can check with the servants if you don't believe me. Sebastian watched him shrug into his coat. I want to know about whales. Vardon adjusted the lapels of his coat. Two men walked into the room, the older one slapping the younger man on the shoulder as he said, Well done, Charles. Well done indeed. Not here, said Vardon. Sebastian nodded. Let's go for a walk. Chapter 46 I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't love Guinevere, Vardon said as they strolled along the serpentine. A fine haze was beginning to bleach the colour from the sky, turning it white. The air had taken on a sultry quality, the scent of grass hanging heavy in the still air. She was... she was like no one else I've ever known. Proud and courageous, and everything that's noble and yet so tender, so giving. There was something about the way the flat light fell on the chevalier's face that reminded Sebastian of just how young Vardon still was. He was only twenty-two, his handsome face pale and hollow-eyed with grief. Gwyn and I grew up together, he said. I suppose Claire and Morgana were around some of the time, but I don't remember them. In my memory, it's always just Gwyn and me. He stared out over the parkland to where two children played with their dog, the dog barking and the children running back and forth and laughing while an aproned nursemaid called to them. A smile touched his lips, a wistful smile that was there and then gone. I always knew she loved me, and I don't mean in the way a child might love a brother. From the very beginning there was more to it than that for both of us, even when we were too young to understand what it was. He fell silent. Sebastian waited, and after a moment Vardon continued, We grew up thinking we would always be together that she was meant for me and I was hers. Gwyn simply took it for granted we would marry someday. And you? I was the same at first. But as I grew older, I became aware of the difficulties. Such as your lack of fortune. He huffed a small, bitter laugh. That most of all. When Guinevere was seventeen, her father's sister invited her to spend the season in London. She'd done the same for Morgana. At the time, old Athelstan had grumbled, but in the end he'd scraped together the money needed for clothes and sent Morgana off. She succeeded better than anyone expected. Athelstan was convinced Guinevere would do even better. Vardon paused. The old bastard needed her to do better. Badly dipped, was he? Vardon nodded. Worse than Guinevere realized. She thought he'd leap at the opportunity to be spared the expense of a London season. But when she told him she had no need of a brilliant alliance because she planned to marry me, he laughed. Then, of course, he flew into a rage. While they'd been talking, a breeze had come up, ruffling the long grass and singing through the high branches of the surrounding elms. In the distance, one of the children brought out a kite a red confection of paper and bamboo that careened straight to earth each time the boy tried to run with it. Vardon's voice was hard. Everything my father would have left me, everything that was in my family for generations, has been lost. All I have is a title and a noble pedigree, and some impoverished royal relatives who are in nearly as bad straits as I am. Sebastian watched the little boy pick up the kite and try again. 
There weren't many noblemen who'd welcome a penniless half-French émigré as a son-in-law. Gwyn tried to argue with him, but Athelstan was ruthless. He threatened to cut her off without a penny and cast her out of the house if she refused to go to London, or if she failed to do what she needed to do while she was there. He meant it to. So she agreed. Not at first. She ran out of the house. Vaudon swung his head away, his eyes narrowing as he too watched the kite. I'll never forget that night. There was a violent storm blowing in from the sea. She came along the cliffs, the way she always had as a child. It's a wonder she wasn't killed. He sucked in a deep, shaky breath. I'd been out riding and been caught in the storm. She found me in the stables. Sebastian pictured Guinevere Anglesey as the young girl she must have been, her wet hair tumbling down her back, her eyes wild with desperation and fear. What did you tell her? The chevalier kept his face turned away, his throat working as he swallowed. What could I say? I was eighteen years old. I couldn't support a wife. I couldn't even marry without permission. Your mother wouldn't have taken her in. The younger man smiled. My mother was fond of Guinevere, particularly when she was a child. But she would never have agreed to such a marriage. Sebastian thought about the proud, elegant woman he'd met. Lady Audley must have watched the maturing affection between the young chevalier and his childhood friend with growing concern. Such a woman's plans for her dispossessed son would not include marriage to the daughter of some impoverished provincial earl. London was full of rich bankers and merchants more than willing to take on a penniless son-in-law, as long as the son-in-law came with a title and a noble lineage and royal connections. What did Lady Guinevere do when you told her? She ran back out into the storm. I tried to go after her, but I couldn't find her anywhere. I was afraid she'd thrown herself from the cliffs. He paused, and it seemed to Sebastian, watching him, as if the skin had tightened across his features, making him look suddenly older. She told me later she almost did. But then she decided she wasn't going to let her father destroy her. She made up her mind to go to her aunt in London and marry a rich old man, the older and richer the better. And then, when he died, she'd be free of him. And free of her father. Yes. That was her plan at any rate. The problem was, while there were plenty of rich old men to choose from, she found the thought of being married to any of them more than she could bear. Until she met Anglesey. Vardon's lips compressed into a thin line. Yes. She said that at first he seemed much like all the others, old and grey and jowly, and carrying far too much weight around his middle. But as she came to know him, she discovered he had a good heart and a fine mind, and they became friends. I think in many ways he was like the father she never really felt she had. Sebastian tilted back his head, his gaze on the red kite climbing now with sudden dips and eddies against the clouding sky. What was it Tess Bishop had said about the Marchioness of Anglesey and her lord? They were well suited to one another. They could spend hours together just talking and laughing. You don't see many couples like that. He wondered if Guinevere had ever told the love of her life just how much affection she'd come to develop for her aged husband. Sebastian doubted it. He turned to study the younger man's troubled face. The night Lady Anglesey was killed, someone tried to break into her room. The Abigail scared them away, but they came back again the next night searching for something. You wouldn't happen to know what that was, would you? Vardon stared off across the parklands as if thinking but there was something about the way he held his mouth that told Sebastian the man didn't need to think that he knew right away what Tess Bishop's mysterious housebreaker had been seeking. He shook his head. I can't imagine. No. I understand you and Lady Anglesey had a quarrel recently, a serious quarrel. Bardon's brows drew together in a quick frown. Who told you that? Does it matter? 
He stopped and swung to face Sebastian, the gravel crunching beneath the soles of his boots. What do you think, that she tried to break things off with me so I killed her? It wasn't like that at all. Sebastian held himself very still. So how was it? Vaudon hesitated a moment, then said in a rush, She was going to leave Anglesey. That's why we quarreled. She wanted me to run away with her. Sebastian stared into the younger man's tense, anxious face and didn't believe one word of it. Why? Why would she even consider doing such a thing? Because she was afraid of him. Oh, I know what you're thinking. He seems so mild-mannered, the perfect 18th-century gentleman. It's what Gwyn thought at first. They were married several years before she saw what he's really like. How is he really? Jealous? Possessive? It was his idea that she take a lover. But then, when she did, he couldn't bear it. In the end, Gwyn was afraid he might kill her, kill her and the baby both. Sebastian shook his head. Nothing is more important to Anglesey than cutting his nephew out of the inheritance. My God, the man was willing to encourage his wife's adultery in the hopes of conceiving an heir. Why would he turn around and harm her? I don't know. But he did it before, didn't he? What are you talking about? That's how his first wife died, didn't you know? She was with child, and he knocked her down the stairs. He killed her, her and the child both. Sebastian was crossing Bond Street, headed toward the Marquis of Anglesey's house on Mount Street, when he heard a man's high-pitched, anxious voice calling his name. Lord Devlin, I say, Lord Devlin. Sebastian turned his head to find Sir Henry Lovejoy hailing him from a battered old hackney. If I might have a word with you, my lord. Chapter 47 London was different from the country. In the country, travelling judges sat only at the quarterly assizes, if then. In the farthest counties, a man could languish in jail for three months to a year waiting for a trial. In London, a man, or a boy, could be caught, tried, and hanged in less than a week. Sebastian tried not to think about that as he and Lovejoy followed a porter through grimy prison passages lit by smoking rushes. The air in here was foul, reeking of excrement and urine and rot. Rotting straw, rotting teeth, rotting lives. They were shown to a cold but relatively clean room, its stone floor bare, the small high barred window casting only a dim light on a grouping of plain wooden chairs and an old scarred table. What were you doing here? Sebastian asked Lovejoy when he and the magistrate were left alone to wait. The watch picked up a couple of housebreakers near St. James's Park the night Sir Humphrey Carmichael's son was killed. I was hoping they might have seen something. And? Lovejoy's lips twisted. Nothing. Footsteps echoed down the passage, a man's heavy stride, and the smaller footfalls of a boy. Sebastian swung toward the door. Tom entered the room with dragging steps, his head bowed. His coat was muddy and torn, his cap gone, his face pale and drawn. It was as if all the boy's plucky determination and jaunty irreverence had been wiped out in one long, hellish night. Here he is, Gumner, said the jailer grudgingly. Thank you, Sebastian's voice came out thick. That will be all. Tom's head snapped up his mouth opening in a gasp. My lord! Lovejoy put out a hand to stop the boy's impetuous forward rush. There, there now, lad. Remember your place. Let him go, said Sebastian, as the boy dodged the magistrate and threw himself against Sebastian's chest. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't break that bloke's watch. The boy's shoulders heaved, his entire body shuddering. They made it up, cause I seen the gunpowder and heard what they was talking about. It's all right, said Sebastian, one hand tightening on the boy's shoulder, even as his gaze met Lovejoy's over Tom's head. Gunpowder? I've come to take you home. 
I was going to hang me, Tom's voice broke. Hang me, just like they done you, e. Sebastian looked down at the boy's tortured, tear-streaked face. Who was Huey? My brother. Huey was my brother. Leaving the prison, Sebastian bundled Tom into the carriage and gave the coachman orders to take the boy to Paul Gibson. Gibson, said the tiger, bounding up. I don't need no surgeon. You're going back there, ain't you, to Smithfield? Well, I'm coming too. You will do as you are told, said Sebastian, in a voice that had quelled rebellious soldiers still bloody from battle. The boy sank back and hung his head. Hi, governor. Sebastian nodded to his coachman, then turned away to call a hackney. Whether you like it or not, I'm coming with you, said Lovejoy, scrambling into the hackney behind Sebastian as he leaned forward to give the Jarvie directions to Smithfield. The law does not look kindly on those who make false accusations of theft. Sebastian threw the magistrate a quizzical glance, but said nothing. Lovejoy settled in one corner of the carriage, his teeth worrying his lower lip as he sat in a thoughtful silence. After a moment he said, All oh, this talk of powder kegs and a repeat of the glorious revolution of 1688. You think that's what's afoot here? Revolution? Sebastian shook his head. Tom had told them in detail what he'd seen and heard beside the Norfolk Arms' cellars. It had been suggestive, but hardly damning. More like a palace coup, I'd say, rather than a revolution. But God knows where it might lead. Change can be difficult to control once it's underway. The French Revolution was started by a few noblemen wanting to revive the old National Assembly, remember? They certainly got more than they bargained for. The steadily thickening clouds had robbed the day of its light, making it seem later than it actually was. Sebastian stared out the window at brick houses streaked with soot, at gin shops spilling drunken laughter into the street. The sultry air smelled of boiling cabbage and horse manure and burning garbage. A boy of ten or twelve, a street sweeper from the looks of him, scrambled to get out of their way his broom held tight in one fist, his eyes wide as he watched them rattle past. Behind him, a little girl of no more than eight, her clothes a jumble of torn rags, her face pale and bleak, stretched out one grimy hand in the beggar's universal plea for help. The hackney swept on, the boy and girl lost in a ragged crowd. Sebastian found himself thinking about two other children, one named Huey, the other Tom, and about their mother, a simple but devout widow out of work and thrown onto the streets with two children to feed. For her, as for untold thousands of women in such a situation, the choices were simple but stark. Starvation, theft, or prostitution. Tom's mother had chosen theft and earned herself a one-way voyage to Botany Bay. Prostitution might have brought her disease and an early death, but it wasn't a capital crime. Stealing to feed your starving children was. From what Tom had told him, Sebastian figured the boy had been nine years old when he and his brother stood on the docks and watched their mother being rowed out to a transport lying at anchor in the Thames. The older by three years, Huey had taken it upon himself to care for his younger brother the best he knew how until they caught Huey for stealing, too. Huey wasn't as lucky as their mother. They'd hanged him. Lovejoy's voice broke into Sebastian's thoughts. We discovered the identity of the man you killed by the river. Sebastian moved his head against the hackney's cracked leather upholstery. I didn't kill him. He fell. Lovejoy's lips twitched which was about as close as the dour little magistrate ever came to a smile. His name was Ahern, Charles Ahern. Never heard of him. Sebastian shook his head. What is known of him? Nothing to his discredit. He served as tutor to Lord Cochrane's sons until the youngest went off to Eton last fall. What's he been doing since then? Lovejoy withdrew a large handkerchief from his pocket and held it to his nose. That 
We're not sure. Sebastian had become aware of a heavy stench of raw smoke overlying the other smells of the district, the reeking tannery pits and the fetid stink of the shambles. Now, as they turned onto Giltspur Street, they could hear shouts and running feet and the roaring crackle of flames, the hackney struggling to wind its way through a thick crowd. From the distance came the steady clang, clang, clang of the fire bell. Something's on fire, said Lovejoy, craning his neck to look out the window. Sebastian could see it now. Flames danced across an ancient pitched roof and shot from windows that yawned like gaping holes in a crumbling brick facade. Thick black smoke billowed up to mingle with the low grey clouds ahead. Bloody hell, swore Sebastian, throwing open the door to leap down even before the hackney had rolled to a halt. It's the Norfolk Arms. Chapter 48 The lane was a confusion of sound, of roaring flames and screaming women and smoke-blackened men, their sweat-slicked faces reflecting the orange glow of the fire as they lined up to form a chain, water sloshing from buckets quickly passed from hand to hand. Sebastian pushed his way through the crowd, his gaze scanning the flame-licked facade of the old inn. Black ash swirled about him, drifting down like dirty snow. He could feel the heat of the fire against his face, feel it sucking the air from his lungs. As he watched, smoke curled from beneath the door of the little bow-windowed button shop that lay beside the inn. Then the front window exploded, and the entire building burst into flames. A great moan went up from the crowd around him. This was what they all feared, that the fire would spread. It was always a danger in any part of the city, but here where houses built of dry old timbers leaned toward one another across narrow, twisted streets. One carelessly minded candle could consume an entire district in a night. Sebastian shifted his attention to the crowd. He expected to find the big black innkeeper at the forefront of the men, dashing bucket after bucket on the growing inferno. But Caleb Carter was nowhere to be seen. Sebastian's gaze stopped on a tall girl with pale grey eyes and lanky blonde hair who stood near the curb. For an instant, her gaze met his. He saw her eyes widen with recognition, her mouth going slack. She whirled to run. Sebastian was on her, his hand closing hard on her upper arm, jerking her around to face him. Where's Carter? he demanded, hauling her up close to him. She stared at him, her eyes huge, her nostrils flaring with fear. He gripped her other arm and lifted her up until her feet barely touched the ground, her head snapping back and forth as he gave her a shake. Where is he, damn you? The cellars. He said something about the cellars. Sebastian thrust her aside. She stumbled but was off and running before he even turned away. The fire had yet to work its way down to the alley to the back of the inn, although he could hear its warning hiss, smell the acrid tinge of smoke in the sultry air. He found the thick wooden doors to the cellars closed and bolted from within. There would be another entrance from inside the inn itself, but time was running out. Sebastian grabbed a nearby length of iron and brought it down hard. The wood cracked and splintered. Someone shouted, Hey, what are you doing there? Ignoring them, Sebastian kicked in the shattered doors. The rush of air from the cellars was unexpectedly hot and dry, and already tinged with smoke. For a moment, Sebastian hesitated. If the gunpowder Tom had watched being unloaded was still stored here, Sebastian could be walking into an explosive death. But he didn't think the men he was dealing with were that careless. Someone had left a lamp lit in the farthest reaches of the cellar. Sebastian could see the distant, steady glow as he plunged down the worn stone steps. The smoke was thicker here, seeping down through the ceiling boards overhead. At the base of the steps, he paused. The cellar itself was earthen-floored. Tall racks of oak barrels and row after row of bottles loomed around him, the air heavy with the rich scents of French wine and brandy, overlaid with the stench of burning wood. The sounds of the fire were muffled here, but coming closer. He could hear the distant roar, and from somewhere nearer, an ominous sizzling crackle. From nearer still came a man's wet, hacking cough. Sebastian turned toward the sound, making his way cautiously amid the towering racks. He found the innkeeper face down in the earth, his arms flung wide, 
his legs sprawled. As Sebastian watched, the big man drew his arms beneath him, his weight on his elbows as he struggled to push himself up. The back of his bald head was dark and shiny with blood that trickled down his neck, soaked the white collar of his shirt. Groaning again, Carter pressed his palms flat to the earth and gave a mighty heave that sent him rolling onto his back. He lay there, his chest jerking with each breath. The blow to the back of his head had obviously stunned him, but what had laid him low and brought a bloody foam to his mouth was the knife someone had thrust between his ribs. The African's eyes rolled in his head, his chest heaving again as Sebastian went to kneel beside him. You, said Carter, his face contorting with pain. What the hell? He fell into a fit of coughing. Sebastian slipped his hands beneath the man's shoulders, raising his head to help him breathe. Who did this to you? Carter's throat worked as he struggled to force the words out, bloody spittle foaming around his mouth. <sniffs> Sebastian leaned closer. The hot scent of urine filled the air as the black man's bladder let loose. He was almost gone, his chest jerking as he fought to suck in air. <sniffs> his upper lip curled, the light in his dark eyes flickering, fading. Fuck you he said, with a rattling gasp, and the light in his eyes went out. Sebastian eased his hands from beneath the big man's shoulders and laid the body on the hard-packed earth. The glow in the cellars had taken on an orange tinge. Looking up, Sebastian saw flames licking across the ceiling. He pushed to his feet. The kegs of gunpowder might be gone, but the cellar's rich store of brandy would be nearly as inflammable. Sebastian leapt for the stairs just as the door from the inn's yard exploded and tongues of fire shot down the steps toward him. Chapter 49 A thick pall of smoke stung Sebastian's eyes, tore at his throat. Throwing one crooked arm in front of his face, he took the stairs to the alley two at a time. He was halfway up the steps when he heard a tearing crack above him. He cast a quick glance over his shoulder in time to see a fiery beam crash onto the stone steps behind him, bringing half the ceiling down with it and unleashing a fierce blast of heat that slapped him in the back, knocking him to his knees. Coughing badly now, he pushed on, practically crawling the last few steps. Wrapping one hand around the edge of the shattered cellar doors, he heaved himself up and staggered out into the cool of the night. He stood with his hands braced on his knees, his head bowed as he sucked in great draughts of sweet, life-giving air. Behind him, the inn had become a fiery shell. Lungs aching, he swung around and watched as the walls collapsed inward, sending a torch of flames and fiery embers roaring up toward the cloud-filled sky. He felt the evening breeze cool against his skin. The breeze and something else that stung his eyelids and ran down his cheeks as he lifted his face to the sky. Rain. Sebastian was sitting on an ancient stone mounting block and wrapping a wet handkerchief around his singed hand when Lovejoy found him. The little magistrate's hat was gone, his collar crooked, his normally spotless shirt front smudged with a black stain that was turning grey now in the steady rain. If your lad was right and there'd been gunpowder in that cellar, the explosion would have taken out half the street, said Lovejoy, removing his spectacles to wipe the lenses. Sebastian used his teeth to tighten the knot in his handkerchief. The gunpowder's gone. They probably moved it last night after Tom was taken up. They couldn't run the risk of someone deciding to investigate the boy's story. Lovejoy's head fell back, the muscles of his face twitching as he stared up at the mouldering facade. And the fire? Was set to destroy whatever evidence they might have missed, I suppose. Sebastian stretched to his feet. That? And to cover up the murder of Caleb Carter? Lovejoy shot him a quick look. You mean the black innkeeper? He's dead? I found him in the cellars. Someone had slipped a knife between his ribs. But why? 
Think about it. Last Wednesday, the Marchioness of Anglesey was seen walking into this inn. As far as we know, no one except her killer ever saw her alive again. A few days later, I show up asking questions about her. Then, last night, my tiger watches a shipment of gunpowder being delivered, and hears talk of a reversal of the glorious revolution of 1688. Something serious is afoot here. But the only link we had to it was Caleb Carter and this inn. Sebastian paused to stare up at the smoking, crumbling walls of the building before him. And now they're both gone. Stopping at Paul Gibson's surgery at the foot of Tower Hill, Sebastian found Tom asleep in Gibson's back bedchamber. I thought it best, said Gibson, one cupped hand shielding the flare of his candlestick. He was exhausted. Sebastian stared down at the sleeping boy. Is he all right? He had a bad fright, but nothing worse. Sebastian nodded. There was no need to elaborate. They both knew what could happen to the boys and girls and men and women, unlucky enough to find themselves in one of His Majesty's prisons. He kept talking about someone named Huey, said Gibson, leading the way to the parlour. Sebastian nodded. His brother. I gather the boy was hanged. Gibson sighed. These are barbarous times in which we live. He went to pour two glasses of wine. This conspiracy to depose the Hanovers. Any idea who might be involved? To have any chance of success, it would need the allegiance of prominent men, both in the army and the government. But do they have that support? Sebastian shrugged. I don't know. I haven't seen any sign of it. But that doesn't mean it isn't there. The Norfolk arms were surely only at the periphery. Could Anglesey be involved? It's possible, I suppose. Although I'd be surprised. Sebastian took the wine from Gibson's hand and went to sink into one of the tattered leather armchairs before the empty fireplace. I haven't found anyone associated with Lady Anglesey's death who's at all in a position of power. He paused. Except for Portland, of course. And he's such a rabid Tory, he hardly seemed a likely candidate to be advocating revolution. Gibson came to stand before the cold hearth. Any idea yet how Lady Hendon's necklace fits into all of this? Sebastian glanced up into his friend's open, concerned face. Once, years ago in Italy, he and this man had been to hell and back together. Their friendship had nothing to do with rank or birth, but with a shared moral code and the deep mutual respect of two men who had tested each other's mettle and found courage under fire and a level-headed response to danger. But even the best of friendships have their limits. Not even to Cat had Sebastian been able to bring himself to say, I don't want to believe it but I'm becoming more and more convinced that my mother didn't drown on that long-ago summer day, because if she had, this Triskelion would have spent the last seventeen years buried in silt someplace at the bottom of the channel. It wouldn't be playing a part now in what happened to Guinevere Anglesey. So Sebastian simply drained his wine and said, No, it's still a mystery. Reaching the house in Brook Street, Sebastian intended to go upstairs, face his valet's tears over another ruined coat, and change into evening attire. Instead, he wandered into the library, poured himself a brandy, and stood staring down at the empty hearth. There was a time for subtlety and cleverness, and there was a time for brute force. Sending Tom to scout out the neighborhood of Giltspur Street had been a mistake, he decided. Not only had he placed the tiger in unconscionable danger, but he'd also missed the chance to go back to the Norfolk Arms himself and directly press Caleb Carter for the truth about the Marchioness's visit to the inn. Now it was too late. He became aware of a bold hand beating an insistent tattoo at the front door. I'm not at home, Morrie, Sebastian said, as his majordomo moved to open the door. Yes, my lord. Taking a sip of his brandy, Sebastian glanced out the window overlooking the front street. 
A smart carriage drawn by a pair of beautifully matched dapple greys stood drawn up before the steps. He didn't need to see the coronet on its panels to know its owner. He could hear Morrie's polite, soothing tones blending with a woman's voice, louder and only too familiar. Don't be ridiculous, said his sister Amanda. I know perfectly well Devlin is at home. I saw him climb the steps myself just moments ago. Now, you can either announce me or I shall simply go looking for him. The choice is yours. Sebastian went to stand in the library's doorway, the brandy glass held lightly in his unbandaged hand, as he studied the tall, slim woman in heavy mourning, who stood in the marble-tiled entry. Leave off harassing the poor man. He's simply following orders. Amanda turned her head to look at him. As I am only too aware. Her eyes widened at the sight of him, her nostrils quivering at the stench of smoke and soot. Merciful heavens, what have you been doing? Hiring yourself out as a chimney sweep? Sebastian laughed and stepped back to sketch her a flourishing bow. Do come in, my lady. She swept past him, jerking off her gloves but making no attempt to remove her bonnet. You realize, of course, that you have the entire town talking about you? Again? Oh, surely not as bad as the last time. She swung to face him, her blue eyes blazing. Is it too much to ask that you have some consideration for your niece? She waved one hand through the air in a dismissive gesture. Oh, not for my sake, but for Hendon's. She is his granddaughter, after all. Sebastian frowned. Stephanie, what is she to do with anything? She is seventeen. In less than a year she will be making her come out. What do you think will be her chances of contracting a respectable alliance if her uncle is known to make a hobby of consorting with murderers? Sebastian went to pour himself another drink. Sherry? he asked. Amanda shook her head. I'm not consorting with Lady Anglesey's murderer, said Sebastian. I'm simply trying to discover who he is. Really, Sebastian, like some common Bow Street runner. With rather more finesse than that, I like to think. And of course, I'm not getting paid, so you needn't worry there's any hint of the stench of trade being attached to the practice. I should rather think not. Sebastian gave her a hard smile. Offends your delicate sensibilities, does it? It would offend the sensibilities of anyone of breeding and culture. Really? Well, murder offends mine. You have no sensibilities. She turned away, one hand coming up to shade her eyes before she suddenly moved to face him again. Why are you doing this? Sebastian took a slow swallow of brandy. I thought I'd just explained that. She shook her head. No. Why you? Why this murder? Sebastian hesitated a moment, then said, Do you remember the blue stone necklace Mother always used to wear? The one she said was given to her by some old crone in the mountains of Wales. Yes. Why? Did you know she was wearing it the day she was lost at sea? No. What has the necklace to do with anything? It was around the Marchioness of Anglesey's neck when her body was found in the pavilion. Amanda's eyes opened wide with surprise. You can't be serious. How extraordinary. Wherever did she get it? No one seems to know. But Jarvis recognized it and suggested I might have my own reasons for looking into the matter. Amanda searched his face. Are you so certain the prince did not kill her? Sebastian met her gaze. Whatever else one might say about Amanda, she was a level-headed, intensely unimaginative woman. If even she had come to suspect Prinny of murder, then the regent was in serious trouble. Sebastian shook his head. She was killed earlier that afternoon. Her body was simply moved to the pavilion and arranged so that he would find her. She frowned. How much earlier was she killed? Some six hours or more. Amanda's lips curled in a contemptuous smile. Ah, there, you see, no great mystery. Why, I could have told you Prinny didn't do it myself. He wasn't even in Brighton earlier that day. Sebastian's hand tightened around his brandy glass. What? Amanda laughed. Did you not know? He was here in London. I saw him myself. 
coming out of Lady Benson's. Last Wednesday. You're quite certain. Last Wednesday was Lady Sefton's breakfast. I wasn't able to attend myself, of course, but I remember it distinctly. She gave the skirts of her morning dress an unconscious twitch. I can quite understand why Prinny kept his visit to town secret, a lady's reputation and all that. Not that Alice Benson has any reputation left. If her father hadn't tied up her portion the way he did, Benson would have divorced her years ago. As it is, I fear being without Alice's fortune would be even more mortifying for Benson than being cuckolded by the prince now, wouldn't it? What time was this? said Sebastian sharply. Shortly before Lady Sefton's breakfast. I'd say sometime in the early afternoon. Amongst the fashionable set, breakfasts were held in the afternoon just as morning visits were held after three o'clock. Sebastian knocked back the rest of his brandy and set the glass aside. Where might I find Lord Jarvis this evening? Jarvis? She paused a moment, thinking. Well, there is Lady Crewe's ball, but I believe I heard something about the dowager Lady Jarvis making up a party for Vauxhall. Sebastian! She called after him as he headed for the stairs. Where are you going? Vauxhall. Chapter 50 Pressing a coin into the wary man's calloused palm, Sebastian stepped onto the quay at Vauxhall. Beside him, a link torch flared against the dark sky to fill the moist, sultry air with the scent of hot pitch. The earlier rain had brought little relief from the heat. As he entered the gardens through the water gate, he found the gravel of the wide main path still showing wet in the glimmering light cast by row after row of glowing oil lanterns. Around him, the thick expanses of lush vegetation steamed. At the grove he paused, his gaze sweeping the colonnades. The sweet strains of Handel's water music drifted through the trees from the orchestra's pavilion in the centre, the melody punctuated with maidenly shrieks from the darker recesses of the gardens. It didn't take him long to locate Jarvis's party in a supper box near the centre of the colonnade. The fierce, hawk-nosed old dowager was there, as was Lady Jarvis, her once pretty face vacant and slack. Sebastian recognised the Baron's two stout middle-aged sisters, one kneading her hands in silent, endless worry, the other as harsh and irascible-looking as her brother. It had all the appearance of a typical family outing, Sebastian thought until one remembered that the dowager had once tried to have her daughter-in-law committed to a lunatic asylum, or that Jarvis had several times offered to have the wasteful husband of his sister Agnes quietly killed. Jarvis himself, however, was absent, as was his daughter, Hero. The presence of two empty chairs suggested they had stepped out for a brief stroll. Glancing at his pocket watch, Sebastian suspected that father and daughter had escaped the family gathering by going to watch the playing of the fountains. Sebastian kept walking. He came upon them near the hermitage. They stood half-turned away, their attention caught by the spectacle of dancing water, so that they remained unaware of Sebastian's approach. He was struck, as before, by the similarity between father and daughter. Sebastian had sometimes heard Miss Hero Jarvis referred to as a handsome woman, for she had large grey eyes and a fine Juno-esque build. But he doubted anyone had ever called her pretty, even when she was a child. Her chin was too square, her nose too close an echo of her father's. She was also far too tall. Sebastian himself stood just over six feet, and she could nearly look him in the eye. It was she who saw Sebastian first, her gaze lighting on him as she turned, laughing at something Jarvis had just said. She froze, the laughter dying on her lips. Sebastian sketched an easy bow. Miss Jarvis, he said, smiling sardonically, as Jarvis himself swung about. If you will excuse us. She hesitated, and Sebastian thought she meant to refuse. The last time they'd met, he'd broken into her house, held a gun to her head, and essentially kidnapped her. But all she said was, Very well. She swept past him, pausing only to lean in close and say quietly, 
If he fails to return safe and unharmed in five minutes, I shall set the guards after you. Sebastian watched her walk away, her head held high, her back straight. Your daughter seems to fear I mean you some harm. My daughter thinks you ought to be locked up. Sebastian turned his gaze to the king's cousin. It has recently been brought to my attention that His Royal Highness the Prince Regent was visiting Lady Benson in London the day the Marchioness of Anglesey was murdered. What time did he make it back to Brighton? Four, six, or later? Jarvis's fleshy face remained impassive. I beg your pardon. The Prince never left Brighton that day. There must be some mistake. Sebastian held the Baron's hard stare. The mistake was yours. It was Jarvis who glanced away, his jaw tightening as he gazed out over the darkened gardens. Who told you? he said at last. Very few people knew. He was seen. They turned to walk together, the gravel crunching beneath their feet, the distant strains of the music drifting to them through the trees. After a moment, Jarvis said, What precisely are you suggesting? That the prince killed Lady Anglesey in London and then hauled her lifeless body back to Brighton with him? Don't be absurd. Not exactly, but perhaps someone else brought her to the pavilion, someone who knew what the prince had done and was determined not to allow the regent to get away with murder the same way his brother Cumberland did. Jarvis faced him the gravel spraying out from under his heels. You are supposed to be finding a way to scotch these ridiculous rumours, not start new ones yourself. Sebastian calmly held his ground. It's what everyone will be saying when the prince's presence in London that day becomes known. And it will become known, have no doubt of that. These sorts of things always do. Wordlessly, Jarvis turned and continued up the walk. After a moment, Sebastian remarked almost conversationally, Did you know the Stuart dagger is back in its rightful place in His Highness's collection? But of course you knew. You're the one who put it there, aren't you? Jarvis swiped one hand through the air in a dismissive gesture. Enough of this. I have decided your assistance in this matter is no longer required. You are to have nothing further to do with it. Sebastian smiled. You should have hired the Bow Street Runners, after all. Them you could have dismissed. Not me. They were passing through a long, arched passage, open at the sides, and illuminated by dozens of brilliantly hued lanterns. Two young women, strolling arm in arm, glanced their way in passing, and Jarvis significantly dropped his voice. If you understood. Sebastian cut him off. How vulnerable the prince's position is at the moment? Ah, but I rather think I do. A rocket exploded overhead, showering the darkened gardens with a rain of light as the fireworks exhibition began. Tell me what you know about the Stuart threat to the dynasty. There are no more Stuarts, said Jarvis blandly. They died out with Henry four years ago. But there are still those with a better claim to the English throne than King George and his sons. And you'll never convince me you don't know their supporters have become active. His hands clasped behind his back, Jarvis turned again to walk toward the colonnade. After a moment, he said, How did you come to know of this? Has it something to do with Lady Angles's death? Possibly. It would help if I knew who is involved. Sebastian didn't expect an answer, but to his surprise, Jarvis pursed his lips and blew out a long breath. We don't know who's involved. Oh, we've managed to get our hands on a few individuals, but they've all been at the lowest levels and they've known nothing of any real importance. Whoever these people are, they're very clever and very well organized. Jarvis dropped his voice even lower. There are suggestions that they have managed to attract supporters in the army, as well as in the highest reaches of the government. But no one seems to know precisely who. It was disquieting information. 
I find it difficult to believe anyone could seriously expect a scheme of this type to succeed, said Sebastian. It wasn't that long ago that the people of London reacted to the Catholic Relief Act with the Gordon Riots. They'd never accept a Catholic monarch. Ah, but you see, the current claimant, the King of Savoy, has a daughter, Anne, married to a Prince of Denmark. She's a Protestant. If Savoy were to resign his claim to the throne in her favour, is that likely to happen? There has been some suggestion of it, yes. The Prince of Denmark has a claim of his own to the English throne. It's weak, of course, but not much weaker than that of William in 1688. A second rocket exploded overhead, filling the night sky with a cascade of coloured light. Jarvis paused to look up, his head tilting back. Times are unsettled, he said, as another rocket burst into clusters of fire. One rip in the fabric of tradition and legitimacy, and who knows where it might end. Killing is always much easier to start than it is to stop. Sebastian watched the coloured stream of fire pour back to earth. If the prince truly is mad, you would do better to admit it now, while the damage might still be contained and a new regent named. If you leave it too long, when he does go down, he might very well take the entire monarchy with him. The prince is not mad, said Jarvis in a low, steady tone. Then he said it again, as if by repeating it he might make it so. He is not mad, and he did not kill that woman. Guinevere, said Sebastian. Her name was Guinevere. Jarvis brought his gaze to Sebastian's face. Leave it, my lord. I'm warning you. Sebastian took a hasty step toward him, only to draw himself up short. Don't. Don't even think about threatening me. Sebastian was crossing the grove with long strides when his gaze fell on another party seated at a table snuggled beneath the elms. A party consisting of Lord Portland, his wife Clare, and his wife's mother, the widowed Lady Audley. Sebastian hesitated, then turned his steps toward them. As he drew nearer, he could hear Portland complaining about the cost of Vauxhall's famous ham, sliced so thin that some claimed one could read a newspaper through it. Look at this, he said, hefting a sliver of ham on his fork. A shilling's worth of sliced ham weighs an ounce here, which means the proprietors are selling this stuff for sixteen shillings a pound. Now, if you figure a thirty-pound ham can be bought for ten shillings, they're making twenty-four pounds on every ham. Lady Portland laughed and laid a hand on her husband's arm. Oh, do give over, Portland. You sound like a merchant in his counting house. When one is out for pleasure, what signifies a few shillings one way or the other? She smiled at Sebastian as he approached. Wouldn't you agree, my lord? Undoubtedly, said Sebastian, sketching the ladies a bow. He turned to Lady Audley. How does your collie bitch? A soft smile touched her lips and shone in her eyes. Well, thank you. She's the proud mother of six fine pups. Vardon does not accompany you tonight. He caught the quickest of exchanged glances between mother and daughter before Lady Portland said laughingly, I'm afraid there aren't many young men who would choose to make one of a party with their mother and their sister when there are livelier amusements to be had. It was true, of course. When men of the Chevalier set came to Vauxhall, it was typically to dance beneath the stars with courtesans and steel kisses and more in the dark, secluded alleys of the gardens. But while that might explain the Chevalier's absence, it did nothing to explain the look Sebastian had intercepted between Lady Audley and the Chevalier's half-sister, Lady Portland. Do you go to the Prince's Fete tomorrow night? asked Lady Audley, drawing his attention. Of course, said Sebastian, but with two thousand guests expected, I must admit I am tempted to outrage all notions of propriety and simply walk, rather than risk spending an hour or more caught up in a snarl of carriages. Perhaps we should do the same, said Lady Portland, with another laugh. Perhaps we'll start a fashion, said Sebastian, withdrawing with a bow, 
just as the whizzing bang of another rocket split the night with fire. Chapter 51 Catching a skull from Vauxhall's Quay, Sebastian directed the boatman toward the steps near the Westminster Bridge, then settled on the thinly cushioned thwart with his long legs thrust out in front and his arms crossed at his chest. The night lay heavy and dark around them, the thick cloud cover holding in the day's muggy heat while hiding the light of both moon and stars. He kept thinking about the woman who had handed Portland that note. What if there had been no mysterious woman in green? What if Portland's part in the evening charade had been less accidental, less innocent? A faint breeze skimmed across the prow, carrying with it the sounds of men's laughter. Looking up, Sebastian saw a livery company barge, its lights reflecting in the dark waters of the Thames as it swept past. He could feel the skull rocking gently with the barges passing, hear its wake slap against the skull's sides, the sound mingling with the gentle splash of his boatman's oars. In the pale light thrown by the skull's lantern, Sebastian studied the man at the oars. He had a thick shock of dark, almost black hair tucked beneath a beaten felt cap, his broad-featured face weathered and toughened by years of sun and wind and rain. With every thrust of his oars, the cords in his thick neck bulged, the muscles of his shoulders and arms straining the worn fustian of his coat. But his movements were slow, almost laconic. Sebastian was about to lean forward and tell the man to put his back into it, when he caught the faint slap of another set of oars coming up fast behind them. Sebastian glanced again at his boatman's closed, lined face. There was something about his posture— something watchful, even anxious, that gave Sebastian pause. It was as if the man were waiting for something. Someone. The sound of the second set of oars drew nearer. In itself, that was in no way unusual. The river was full of wherries transporting passengers from one bank to the other. Given his boatman's slow progress, a more energetic oarsman could easily overtake them. And yet... Shifting his weight, Sebastian threw a quick glance over one shoulder. He saw the prow of a dinghy appear out of the gloom, its hull painted black, its oarsman a dark shadow. A man with less acute hearing and eyesight would have remained oblivious to its presence. Deliberately, Sebastian turned his back on the approaching boat. It was the perfect place for an attack, Sebastian thought. Here he had no place to run, no hope of any assistance from chance passers-by. His options were strictly limited. The shore was a distant line of black against black. They were just over midway between the banks, in a river that ran a quarter of a mile wide. The livery barge, with its gaily reflected lights and laughing crew, was long gone. If Sebastian could extinguish the skull's lamp, it might be possible for him to go over the side and strike out for shore beneath the cover of darkness. Yet the tide was running strong, and a lamp could be relit. He decided to take his chances here, now. The dip and pull of the second set of oars came closer, mingling with the gurgle of the river washing against the approaching dinghy's bow. He could feel the closing boat as a looming presence, a thing of darkness materializing out of the night. Holding himself tense and still, Sebastian heard the dinghy part the waters directly behind them. He heard its oars slip, heard the telltale shift of timbers as the unknown second boatman rose. The skull's oarsman paused in his stroke, his jaw clenched as he stared intently straight ahead. Sebastian waited until the last possible instant until he heard the whistle of wood sweeping through the thick, sultry air. Then he threw himself forward flattening himself against the wet, mud-smeared bottom of the skull just as the dark-coated man in the dinghy swung the flat edge of his oar at the space where Sebastian's head had been. The momentum of the oar's weight carried the man's body around and opened up an expanse of black water between the two boats, the dinghy lurching as the boatman struggled to regain his balance. Rolling onto his back on the skull's wet, grimy planks, Sebastian saw his own oarsman ship his oars and rise his lips pulled back in a grimace, a knife clutched in his left hand. Thrusting up his right arm, Sebastian broke the man's forward lunge and caught his wrist in a hard grip. 
Beneath them, the skull pitched dangerously. Sebastian lurched up onto his knees. You bloody bugger, swore the boatman, his breath foul against Sebastian's face. Struggling up, Sebastian felt the skull shudder as the second boat bumped against its side again. Out of the corner of one eye, he saw the shadow of the dinghy's oar raised to strike. Pivoting quickly, he swung the skull's boatman around, using the man as a shield just as the oar came whistling through the air toward them. The edge of the oar's blade caught the boatman just below the ear, the impact making a dull thwunk. With a sharp cry, he pitched sideways. His body hit the water with a splash that sprayed through the air and set the skull to tipping violently. A sharp movement brought Sebastian to his knees again. He freed one of the skull's oars and brought it up, driving the tip of the handle like a blunt lance into the second boatman's chest just as he swung again. The oar's tip caught the man at the junction of his ribs. He was a small man, with longish blonde hair and the thin, effete face of a gentleman. For one brief instant, his gaze met Sebastian's. Then his eyes rolled back in his head, and he toppled off the skull's prow with a splash. His breath coming in quick gasps, Sebastian fit the oar back into place. They were near enough by now to Westminster Bridge that he could see its lights reflected in the black waters of the river. He heard the voice of the skull's oarsman raised in panic. Help! I can't swim! The warm wood of the oars felt smooth beneath his hands as Sebastian settled into place. Pausing, he glanced over at the oarsman's bobbing head. Who hired you? Bloody hell, throw me a line. I can't swim. Then I suggest you save your breath said Sebastian, leaning into his oars. Swearing loudly, the boatman called after him. The yellow-headed bloke in the greatcoat, he hired me. I don't know who he is. Sebastian scanned the gently heaving waters. The blonde-headed man in the dark greatcoat had disappeared. The boatman's voice came again. Oi, you gonna throw me a line? Here. Sebastian nudged the dinghy's floating oar toward the floundering man. I suggest you use it to remove yourself from the vicinity. The Thames Patrol doesn't tend to look kindly on boatmen who try to murder their fares. Chapter 52 Cat watched Devlin peel off his shirt, the soft light from the brace of candles beside her bedroom washstand glazing the skin of his neck and back with gold as he bowed his head to study the smears of foul-smelling muck on the fine cloth of his evening coat. Bloody hell, if this keeps up, my valet is going to succumb to a fit of the vapours. Or quit. Coming up behind him, Cat ran her hand across his bare shoulders, her fingertips gentling as she traced a long bruise there, just beginning to show purple. It's taking a toll on your body as well. Tossing the ruined coat aside, he pivoted to draw her into his arms. At least nothing vital has been damaged, he said, with a hint of laughter. They meant to kill you tonight. He nibbled at the tender flesh behind her ear. I think the idea was to have my body wash ashore, somewhere around Greenwich. She drew back so that she could look up at him. But why? Why do these people want you dead? He shrugged. They obviously think I know more about this conspiracy than I do. Perhaps. Or perhaps they're simply afraid of what you might learn. She pulled away and went to get him a brandy. Who's behind it, do you think? Even Jarvis doesn't know. He poured water from the pitcher into the bowl and bent to splash his face. It's bigger than any one man, or even a score. Something like this needs a broad base of support if it's to have any chance of success. Yet someone must be at its core. He nodded. The Whigs would seem the most likely candidates. They spent the last twenty years expecting Prinny to sweep them back to power. Only now he's been made regent and the Tory government is still firmly in place. The problem is... I can't see the more radical Whigs risking their lives simply to replace one dynasty of spoiled crown fools with another. Why not do away with the monarchy altogether? You mean, like the French? said Cat with a wry smile. I was thinking more about the American model. 
he straightened and reached for a towel. The Tories would make better suspects, except that they're already in power and will likely stay there for another twenty years or more. So why would they want to get rid of Prinny? Especially when moving against the Hanovers might very well set in motion precisely the kind of popular movement the Tories fear the most, said Cat. Thinking about what Aidan O'Connell had said that morning in Chelsea, he glanced over at her. You mean a revolution? Or a civil war? I doubt they'd see the danger. Not men with the kind of hubris required to plot to overthrow a dynasty. It's probably never occurred to them just how easily they could lose control of everything. But what does any of this have to do with the death of Lady Anglesey? I wish I knew. Devlin tossed the towel aside. I suppose she might simply have stumbled across something, the way Tom did in the alley behind the Norfolk Arms. Or... He hesitated. Or she could have been involved in it herself, said Cat, handing him the brandy. He took a sip and looked up to meet her gaze. It's possible, isn't it? Cat was thoughtful for a moment remembering what else Aidan O'Connell had said about a Stuart restoration leading to peace with France. Alain Bardon was half French. The Chevalier de Bardon, she said suddenly, what are his political inclinations? As far as I can tell, he has none, or at least none he's made known. His brother-in-law, Portland, is obviously a Tory, as is Morgana's husband, Lord Quinlan. But then most men of birth and property are Tories, including Anglesey. And my own father. Devlin went silent for a moment, the glass of brandy held forgotten in his hand. What is it? When I saw Vardon this afternoon at Angelo's, he told me Guinevere wanted to leave Anglesey, that she was afraid of him. Afraid? Why? He said Anglesey killed his first wife. Is that possible? I'd heard his first wife died in childbirth. I was on my way to Mount Street to ask him about it when Lovejoy caught up with me this afternoon. What are you suggesting? That Guinevere somehow found out about her husband's involvement with the Stuarts and was afraid he'd kill her to keep quiet? But surely she wouldn't betray her own husband, would she? Devlin brought up one hand to rub his forehead and she realized just how tired he was. Tired and frustrated. Obviously, I'm still missing something. Something important. Slipping her arms around his waist, Cat pressed her body close to his. She would never be his wife, but she could know the joy of holding him, of loving him, and being loved by him. She told herself that was enough. For his sake, it would have to be enough. You'll find it, she said, her voice low and husky. If anyone can, you will. Now, come to bed. She awoke before dawn to find the place beside her cold and empty. She turned her head, her gaze searching the room. He was standing beside the window, one of the heavy drapes pulled back so that he could look out upon the gradually lightening street. He was turned halfway from her, so that all she could see was his profile, and he had his head bent, as if he gazed not at the street below, but at something he held in his hand. It wasn't until she slipped from beneath the covers and went to curl her arms around his shoulders that she realized he held his mother's blue stone necklace, the silver chain threaded through the fingers of one hand. What is it? she asked, nuzzling his neck. What's wrong? He reached back his free hand to cup her head in his palm and draw her around to him. Amanda came to see me last night. Lady Wilcox, said Cat in surprise. As far as Cat knew, Devlin's sister hadn't spoken to him since February. She's concerned that my unusual activities might harm her daughter's chances of contracting a successful alliance. She wanted to know what had possessed me to do something so plebeian as to take part in a murder investigation. You told her about the necklace? Yes. He held up the necklace so that the Triskelion swung slowly on its chain, tracing a short arc through the darkness. She was puzzled, 
but not surprised. Cat studied the shadowed lines and angles of his profile, but he had all his emotions locked away someplace where she couldn't see them. Perhaps the implications escaped her. One corner of his mouth lifted in a tight smile. Oh, no. Amanda is nothing if not quick. She might have been puzzled that my mother would give up something she'd always held dear. But it never occurred to her to question what happened that day off the coast of Brighton. Cat drew in a deep breath. What are you seeing, Sebastian? He turned his head to look directly at her, and for one unguarded moment she saw it all. The bewildered mingling of anger and hurt, confusion and pain. Amanda knows. She's always known. He let out a soft huff of laughter that held no humour. That pleasure outing, the sinking of the yacht, it was all for show. My mother didn't drown that summer. She simply left. She left my father, and she left me. But she didn't die. His hand closed over the necklace, his knuckles showing white in the first light of dawn. She didn't die. Chapter 53 Amanda was seated at her breakfast table, the morning post spread out beside her plate, when her brother strolled unannounced into the room. She didn't look up. The Countess of Hendon's silver and bluestone necklace hit the newsprint beside her, the unexpected slap startling her enough that it was only with effort that she avoided flinching. Holding herself composed, she lifted her gaze to Devlin's. The blaze of emotion she saw there was so raw and powerful that her gaze veered away again before she could quite stop it. She's still alive, isn't she? he said. Amanda drew in a deep, steadying breath and defiantly stared into his terrible yellow eyes. Yes. How long have you known? Since that summer. He nodded, as if she'd only confirmed what he'd already suspected. And Hendon. He knows, of course. He is known from the very beginning. He helped to arrange it. She saw a flicker of... What? Surprise? Pain? in the depths of those strange animalistic eyes. And why wasn't I told? Amanda gave him a wide, malicious smile. I suggest you ask Hendon. It wasn't often Sebastian allowed his thoughts to drift back to that long-ago summer, the summer before he turned twelve. It had been hot, days of unrelenting blue sky, and a sizzling golden sun that turned the crops to dust in the fields. Wells that had never failed in a hundred years or more ran dry. The Countess of Hendon had spent most of that spring and summer at the family's principal seat in Cornwall. His mother loved London, loved the excitement and mental stimulation of the political salons as much as the endless round of balls, breakfasts, and shopping expeditions that occupied most women. But Hendon considered London an unhealthy place for women and children, especially when the streets turned dry and dusty and the air hung close. His involvement in affairs of state might keep Hendon himself tied to Whitehall and St. James's Palace, but that year he insisted that his wife retire to Cornwall and that Sebastian and his brother Cecil join her there when they came down from Eton. Sebastian tried to recall how Sophie had occupied herself that summer, but his memories were of tramping the fields and woods with Cecil and swimming in the forbidden cove below the cliffs. In his recollections, she was an atypically distant figure seen riding out each morning on her neat bay hack. He had one clear image of an afternoon's tea served on the sun-splashed terrace. Sophie's smile bright yet still somehow distant. And then, in July, the family had gone to spend the month in Brighton. Sophie adored Brighton, reveling in the concerts on the Steen and the balls at the castle and ship. But that year, even Brighton was hot and dusty and crowded with those anxious to escape from the stifling, unhealthy interior. Hendon grumbled that Brighton had grown as foul and noisome as London and threatened to send the Countess and their sons back to Cornwall. The Countess alternately stormed and wept, 
begging to be allowed to stay. And so they had stayed, until the morning in mid-July when Sebastian's brother Cecil awoke flushed and feverish. By nightfall he had become delirious. The best doctors were called in all the way from London. They shook their heads and prescribed bloodletting and calomel. But Cecil's fever continued to climb. Two days later, he was dead, and Sebastian found himself the new Viscount Devlin, his father's only surviving son and heir. There followed tense weeks filled with loud voices and angry accusations. But whenever he was around Sebastian, Hendon kept a strange, tight silence. It was as if he couldn't comprehend why fate had taken his first and second-born sons and left him only the youngest, the one least like their father. For Sebastian, those days remained a painful blur, but he could remember quite clearly the sunny morning Sophie Hendon sailed away on what was supposed to have been a simple day's outing with friends and never came back. The pain of that summer fueled Sebastian's anger now as he took the steps to his father's house on Grosvenor Square. He found Hendon in the entrance hall, headed for the stairs. The earl was dressed in breeches and top boots, his crop in one hand, and it was obvious he'd only just come in from his morning ride. What is it? he asked, his gaze on Sebastian's face. Sebastian crossed the hall to throw open the door to the library. This is a conversation we need to have in private. Hendon hesitated, then came away from the stairs. Very well. He walked into the room and tossed his crop on the desk as Sebastian closed the door. Now, what is it? When were you planning to tell me the truth about my mother? Hendon swung around, his expression guarded and wary. Which truth is that? Bloody hell! Sebastian let out his breath in a sharp, humorless laugh. Are there so many lies? I mean the truth about what happened seventeen years ago in Brighton. Or should I say what didn't happen? Is she still alive today? Or do you even know? Hendon held himself very still, as if carefully considering his answer. Who told you? Does it matter? You should have told me yourself, long before I asked you about the necklace. Hendon blew out a long, slow breath. I was afraid. Of what? The Earl drew his pipe from a drawer, his movement slow and deliberate as he filled the bowl with tobacco and tamped it down with his thumb. She's still alive, he said, after a moment, or at least she was as of last August. Every year she delivers to my banker a letter briefly detailing the major political and military events of the previous twelve months. Once we have proof she still lives, I send her annual stipend. Sebastian was aware of a fine trembling going on inside him. He couldn't have said if the discovery Sophie still lived after seventeen years of his thinking her dead brought him relief or only fueled his rage. You pay her. Why, to stay away? It's not such an unusual arrangement. Couples who can no longer live together frequently agree to live apart. Look at the Duke and Duchess of York. The Duchess of York didn't fake her own death. Hendon went to kindle a taper and hold it to his pipe. Your mother. She was involved with another man. For her to have lived with him openly here in England would have ruined my standing in the government. She agreed to go abroad in return for my granting her an annual stipend. Sebastian was silent for a moment. Had there been a man that summer? A special man? Impossible to remember. There were always men around Sophie Hendon. Why didn't you simply divorce her? He said aloud, searching his father's heavily featured face. What does she have on you? Hendon met his gaze and held it. Nothing I intend to tell you. My God. And the necklace? I honestly don't know how Guinevere Anglesey came to be wearing that necklace. I suppose it's possible your mother gave it to someone over the years. Sebastian doubted it. 
Sophie Hendon had never been a particularly superstitious woman, but she had believed in that necklace and in its power. Where is she now? Hendon sucked on his pipe, kindling the tobacco. Venice, or at any rate, that's where I send the money. The acquaintances she went out with that day, the ones who helped coordinate the accident, they were Venetians. The air filled with the sweet smell of burning tobacco. Sebastian stood at one of the long windows overlooking the square. All those years, he said half to himself, all those years of missing her, of mourning her. And it was all a lie. He was aware of his father coming to stand behind him, although he didn't turn his head. If she could have taken you with her, said Hendon, his voice gruff, I think she would have. Of all her children, I always thought her love for you was the most intense. Sebastian shook his head, his gaze on the scene outside the window. A boy and a girl of ten or twelve were running with a hoop, their laughing voices carrying lightly on the morning breeze. He'd had that sense himself growing up. Sophie Hendon had loved all her children, but until today, Sebastian would have said he'd held a special place in her heart. Yet she had left him. He was aware of a yawning inner ache that twisted his guts and brought a bitter taste to his mouth. A heavy silence stretched between them. A silence Sebastian ended by slamming one hand down on the sill and swinging away from the window to face his father again. Why the hell didn't you tell me the truth? You let me think she was dead. Every day I went up on those cliffs looking for her, hoping it was all a mistake, and I'd see her come sailing home. But in the end, I gave up. I believed what you had told me. And it was all a bloody lie. Sebastian stared at his father. The earl's jaw worked back and forth, but he said nothing. Why? I thought it for the best. For whom? You, me, or her? For all of us. Sebastian rushed past his father and headed for the door. Well, you were wrong. Chapter 54 The Dowager Duchess of Claiborne awoke with a start one hand groping up to catch her nightcap before it slid over her eyes. A tall, shadowy figure moved across the floor of her artificially darkened bedchamber. She gave a faint gasp, then sat up in bed, her cheeks flushing with the heat of indignation when she recognized her only surviving nephew. Good heavens, Devlin, you nearly gave me an apoplectic fit. What are you doing here at this ungodly hour? And why are you glaring at me in such a fashion? He came to stand beside the carved footboard of her massive Tudor bedstead, his lean figure held taut. Seventeen years ago, Sophie Hendon did not die in a boating accident. She simply left her husband and surviving children behind and sailed away. Tell me you didn't know. Henrietta let out a sigh. She wished she could deny it. Instead, she said, I knew. He swung abruptly away going to jerk open one of the heavy velvet drapes at the window and letting in a stream of bright morning sunshine that made Henrietta groan. She brought up a hand to shade her eyes and sat up straighter. I thought at the time you deserved to be told the truth, but it wasn't my decision to make. I'm told she left with a man. Is that true? She stared at the rigid set of his shoulders. Yes. He nodded. As I recall, there were other men in her life. Had been for years. Why did she decide to leave with this one? The others were distractions, or tools of revenge. I could only assume this one was different somehow. Who was he? I don't recall his name. He was a poet, I believe. A most romantic-looking young man. A Venetian. There was some Venetian connection, but the young man himself was French. He was younger than she. Yes. You met him. Henrietta twitched at the high embroidered collar of her nightdress. He was quite the darling of society that spring, although, if I remember correctly, he left town early. 
Where did he go? Cornwall? Evidently. Devlin brought up one hand to rub his eyes. Looking at him, Henrietta thought he looked older and more exhausted than she could remember having seen him. Do you know where she is now? he asked. Your mother? No, we were never close, and we certainly didn't keep in contact after she left. I don't believe even Hendon knows precisely where she went, although he sends money to her every year. Why? He's certainly not doing it out of the goodness of his heart. She obviously knows something, something he's willing to pay to keep quiet. What is it? The Duchess of Claiborne looked into her nephew's troubled eyes and for the first time that morning told him a blatant lie. I honestly don't know. Sir Henry Lovejoy was annoyed. He was making little headway in his attempt to capture the man the press had taken to calling the butcher of St. James's Park. He had the magistrates from Bow Street interfering in his investigation of the Carmichael murder. And now he was having to take time away from pursuing several promising leads to deal with an irate foreign embassy and a decidedly peeved foreign office. Leaving Whitehall, Lovejoy hailed a hackney and went to see Viscount Devlin. He found Devlin just preparing to mount his front steps. I need to speak to you, my lord, said Lovejoy, executing a small bow on the footpath. The Viscount was looking unusually pale and distracted. He hesitated then said crisply, of course, and led the way into his library. Please have a seat, Sir Henry. How may I help you? I won't detain you but a moment, said Sir Henry, standing with his round hat held in both hands. One of the wary men pulled a body from the Thames last night. The Viscount's features sharpened with interest. Anyone I know? A foreigner, said Lovejoy, watching the young man's face from northern Italy. Devlin's brows twitched together in a frown. A thin man with blonde hair. Ah, so you do know him. He tried to kill me last night, and so you killed him. He fell into the Thames, said the Viscount blandly. What made you think to come to me? Lovejoy made a non-committal sound far back in his throat. He was a known associate of your previous victim, Charles Ahern, Sir Henry added, when Sebastian simply stared at him in puzzlement. The gentleman you killed near Hungerford Market. I didn't kill Ahern, remember? He fell too, said Devlin with a soft smile. The smile faded quickly. You're certain the blonde man was Italian? Quite. Settling his hat back on his head, Lovejoy turned to take his leave. He was a cousin of the King of Savoy. Chapter 55 After Lovejoy's departure, Sebastian stood for some time with his gaze fixed on an ancient pair of crossed swords hanging on the library's far wall. The link between the King of Savoy and the effete blonde man who had chased Tom through the streets of Smithfield and tried to drown Sebastian in the Thames seemed inevitable. The connection between the conspiracy to depose the Hanovers, Lady Anglesey's murder, and the ancient bluestone necklace that had once belonged to Sophie Hendon remained less clear. But it was a puzzle Sebastian knew he was never going to unravel as long as he allowed himself to dwell on the events of that distant summer and the lies it had spawned. And so he forced himself to put away the rage and hurt, and focus instead on what his new knowledge of his mother's true fate added to his understanding of Guinevere Anglesey's death. The tie between the Countess of Hendon and an unknown French poet with Venetian connections was troubling, although Sebastian was not yet convinced it was significant. Sifting through all that he had learned in the last few days, he decided it was past time he paid another call on the bereaved Marquis of Anglesey. Reaching out, Sebastian gave the bell beside the mantel a quick tug. Have Giles bring round my caracol, he told Morrie when the majordomo appeared. Morrie gave a stately bow. Yes, my lord. But when Sebastian stepped out of the house some fifteen minutes later, it was to find his tiger, Tom, 
reining in the chestnuts at the base of the steps. What the devil are you doing here? Sebastian demanded. I told you to take a couple of days off and rest. I don't need no days off, said the boy, his features pinched and set. This is my job, and I'm doing it. Sebastian leapt into the caracol and took the reins. Your job is to do what you're told. Now get down. The boy gave a loud sniff and stared straight ahead. It's on account of I let you down, ain't it? I flubbed it. And because of me, you almost ended up fish bait. No, you didn't let me down. I let you down by exposing you to unconscionable peril. These people are dangerous, and I'll be damned if I'm going to be responsible for getting you killed. Now hop off. The tiger kept staring straight ahead, but Sebastian noticed he blinked several times, and the muscles of his throat worked hard as he swallowed. There's boys younger than me serving as cabin boys in His Majesty's Navy, and going to war as drummer boys. I guess you reckon I couldn't do those things either. Bloody hell, said Sebastian, giving his horses the office to start. Just don't take any more unnecessary risks, you hear? And next time I tell you to do something and you don't obey me, you're fired. Understand that? Clapping one hand to his hat to hold it in place, Tom scrambled back to his perch and grinned. Aye, Governor. The Marquis of Anglesey moved across the floor of his conservatory with slow, painful steps. It seemed to Sebastian, watching him, that the man had aged visibly in the past week. He looked around at the sound of Sebastian's footfalls, one hand tightening on the edge of the shelf of orchids beside him, as if for support. What is it? Sebastian paused in the centre of the room, the warm humidity of the place pressing in on him like a blanket, the smell of damp earth and lush foliage heavy in the air. I want you to tell me how your first wife died. To his surprise, a wry smile lifted one corner of the old man's lips. He turned away to begin carefully plucking yellowing leaves from a large china rose. I take it you've heard the rumors about how I pushed her to her death. Pushed her? Anglesey nodded. She slipped on the stairs at Anglesey Hall. She was big with child, clumsy. She couldn't catch herself. His hands stilled at their task, his gaze becoming unfocused as he lifted his head to stare away, as if into the past. Perhaps she would have died in childbirth anyway, he added softly. She wasn't well those last few months, but there's no way to know. He brought his gaze back to Sebastian's face. Who told you I killed her? Does it matter? No, I suppose not. Anglesey plucked a nubber leaf and dropped it into the basket he held slung over one arm. What are you suggesting? That I have a nasty habit of killing my pregnant wives. What possible reason could I have for killing Guinevere? Jealousy, perhaps. Because of the child she carried? You forget how desperately I wanted that child. People in the grip of strong emotion often act against their own interest. It could be she discovered something about you, something you didn't want her to know. Guinevere knew about my first wife. I told her of the rumors before we were married. I wasn't talking about your first wife's death. The old man looked around, puzzled. Then what? Perhaps she learned of your involvement in a conspiracy to restore the Stuart dynasty to the throne. The Marquis looked unexpectedly pensive, his eyes narrowing. The man's body might be weakening, Sebastian thought, but it would be a mistake to assume that his mind was also failing. I've heard murmurs, innuendo, disgruntled whispers, but I must admit I never credited them. I assumed it was all just wild talk, wishful thinking. Do you mean to say there's something in it? What could it possibly have to do with Guinevere's death? That's what I haven't been able to figure out yet, Sebastian paused, 
I'd like to take a look around your wife's room, if I may. The request obviously caught Anglesey by surprise. He drew in a quick breath, but said, Yes, of course, if you wish. Nothing has been touched. I know I should let Tess gather Gwyn's things together and give them to the poor, but somehow I haven't been able to bring myself to do it. Gwyn. It's what Vardon had called her, Sebastian remembered. He let his gaze drift over the aged nobleman before him. If Guinevere had been simply shot or even stabbed, Sebastian might have found it easier to consider the Marquis a suspect. But it was hard to see how this frail old man could have played a part in the complicated charade that had followed her murder. Sebastian turned toward the house, then paused to look back and say, Is there any possibility that your wife was planning to leave you? The Marquis still stood beside the rose, the basket of yellowing leaves gripped in one hand. No, of course not. So sure. A ragged cough shook the old man's frame. He turned half away, his hand fisting around a handkerchief he brought to his mouth. When the cough subsided, he tucked the cloth quickly out of sight, but not before Sebastian glimpsed the bright stains of blood against silk. Anglesey looked up to find Sebastian watching him. A faint band of colour touched the old man's pale cheeks. So, you see, why should Guinevere consider leaving me when she'd have been a widow soon enough? According to my doctors, I'll be lucky to last out the summer. Did your wife know? Anglesey nodded. She knew. It's ironic, isn't it? I keep thinking about the day before I was to leave for Brighton. Normally she was strong about what was happening to me, but I'd had a difficult night and she took it badly. She tried to hide her face from me, but I knew she was weeping, and she said... His voice cracked. He looked away in some embarrassment, his eyes blinking, his lips pressed together for a moment before he was able to go on. She said... She couldn't imagine how she was ever going to live without me. Sebastian found Guinevere's rooms enveloped in silent darkness, the drapes at the windows drawn closed against the daylight. A light scent hovered in the air, as if the memory of the woman still lingered here, elusive and sad. He crossed to open the drapes, the thick carpet absorbing his footsteps. The windows overlooked the garden below. From here he could see Anglesey's conservatory, and the limb of the big old oak that thrust out close enough to give access to the bedchamber, just as Tess Bishop had described it. Sebastian turned back to the room. The bed's hangings, like the drapes at the windows and the upholstery of the chairs beside the hearth, were done in a soft yellow. The morning sun filled the room with a warm, cheerful light. He couldn't have said what he'd been expecting, but it wasn't this. This sense of serenity and calm joy. It didn't seem to fit with what he knew of Guinevere Anglesey, a woman torn between her passion for a lifelong love and her growing affection for her aging, dying husband. He worked his way methodically through the apartment, starting with the dressing room, not at all certain what he was looking for. The intruder who had come here after Guinevere Anglesey's death had been desperate to get his hands on something. Had he been successful, Sebastian wondered, or not? Opening a chest near the largest wardrobe, he found himself looking at tiny caps decorated with delicate tucking and lace, nestled amid stacks of carefully folded miniature gowns and white flannel blankets embroidered with birds and flowers. His chest aching with a strange catch, he searched it quickly and gently closed the lid. Returning to the bedchamber, he stood in the centre of the rug, his thoughtful gaze taking in the sun-filled room. On the mantel above the empty hearth, Guinevere had kept a collection of seashells casually arranged beside an ormolu clock. Mementos from her childhood in Wales? Intrigued, he was walking over to study them when a flash of white from the rear of the cold grate caught his eye. Crouching down beside the hearth, he reached back to free it from the grate and found himself holding a tightly wadded sheet of paper. Straightening, 
He uncrumpled the paper and smoothed it out upon the flat top of the marble mantel. It was a short note, written in a bold, masculine hand. Beloved, I must see you again. Please, please let me explain. Meet me Wednesday afternoon at the Norfolk Arms in Giltspur Street in Smithfield, and bring the letter. Please don't fail me. The signature was scrawled, but still legible. Vardon. Chapter 56 It took some time, but Sebastian eventually tracked the Chevalier de Vardon to White's in St. James's. Here he is, Governor, said Tom, jumping down from his perch to run to the chestnut's heads. The Chevalier was descending the club's front steps in the company of another young buck when Sebastian drew in the caracal close to the footpath. If I might have a word with you, sir, he called. The Chevalier exchanged a few pleasantries with his companion, then strolled over to the caracal's side. Oh, what is it, my lord? The smile that accompanied the words was pleasant enough, but his eyes were guarded and wary. Sebastian returned the smile. Drive with me a ways, won't you? There's something I'd like you to see. The Chevalier hesitated, then shrugged and bounded up beside him. Stand away from their heads, called Sebastian bending his hand to give the horses the office to start. What is it? Varden asked as Tom scrambled back up to his perch. I was wondering what you might make of this. Without taking his eyes from the road, Sebastian drew the crumpled note from his pocket and held it out. He was aware of Vardon's breath quickening as he took the note and read it through. His hand tightened around the paper, his face fierce when he looked up to meet Sebastian's quizzical gaze. Where did you get this? It was behind the grate in Lady Anglesey's bedchamber. But I don't understand. He thumped the back of one hand against the crumpled page, his voice tight with anger. I didn't write this. That isn't your handwriting. No. Vardon shook his head, as much in confusion as in denial. It looks like it, but it's not. I tell you, I didn't write it. If it was a lie, it was a very good one. Yet Sebastian had known people who could lie with such ease and apparent sincerity that it would never occur to the unwary to suspect them. Cat could lie like that. It was a gift that served her well on the stage. Would you say the writing is similar enough that it could have deceived Lady Anglesey? Sebastian asked, reserving judgment. Vardon read through the note again. It must have done so, obviously. This hotel, the Norfolk Arms? Is that where she went? The afternoon she died? Sebastian nodded. And the letter she was supposed to bring with her? I have no idea, said Vardon, meeting Sebastian's gaze and holding it unblinkingly. This time Sebastian thought, That line was delivered less well, my friend. Turning the caracal in through the gates to Hyde Park, he said aloud, Tell me again about your quarrel. A faint flush darkened the chevalier's lean cheeks. What more is there to say? She wanted to leave. No, said Sebastian, anger putting a tight edge on his voice. That's pitching it too rum by half. Anglesey is dying and his wife knew it. She had no reason to leave him and every reason not to. Sebastian thought for a moment that Vardon meant to brazen it out. Then he pursed his lips and expelled his breath in an audible gust as if he'd been holding it. All right, I admit I made that up. The quarrel, pressed Sebastian. What was it about? Vardon set his jaw. What happened that night was between Gwyn and me. It has nothing to do with her death. This note suggests otherwise. I tell you, it has nothing to do with her death. So certain? Yes. Sebastian doubted it, but he decided for the moment to let it go. Whoever had sent that note, whether Vardon or someone else, had obviously known about the quarrel, had known about it, and used it to lure Guinevere Anglesey to her death. Tell me, said Sebastian, his attention seemingly all for his driving. Who do you think really killed her?
Vardon fixed his gaze on the horses' heads, their manes tossing lightly with the late morning breeze and the smooth action of their gait. After a moment, he said, When I heard she was dead, I naturally assumed Bevan Ellsworth was responsible. Then I heard she'd been found in the prince's arms, and I thought he'd done it. A part of me still suspects Ellsworth, although you say it couldn't have been him, that he was otherwise occupied that day. He swiped an open hand across his face, rubbing his eyes. Now? I don't know. I just don't know, he repeated softly. Sebastian drew the blue stone necklace from his pocket and held it out. Have you ever seen this before? The Chevalier stared at the necklace, his nostrils flaring with a sudden intake of breath, his eyes opening wide with what looked very much like horror. Good God! Where did you get that? Sebastian threaded the silver chain through his gloved fingers. It was around Lady Anglesey's neck when she was found in the pavilion. What? But that's... He broke off. Impossible. Why? You have seen it before, haven't you? Where? Vardon stared off across the park. Even this early in the day, the park was crowded. The morning had dawned clear, the sun warm in an open blue sky. But dark clouds could be seen building again on the horizon, threatening more rain before nightfall. The summer when I was twelve or thirteen, my mother took us to the south of France. There was a peace then, if you remember. It didn't last long, but my mother missed France and she wanted us to see it. We took Guinevere with us. Just Lady Guinevere. Vardon shook his head. Morgana, too. We stayed with some people who had a chateau near Cannes. Somehow or another, they'd managed to survive the revolution, although they'd fallen on hard times. We came to know a woman there, an Englishwoman who was another of their guests. The necklace was hers. She told us a strange story about it, how it had once belonged to a mistress of James II and how the necklace always chose the next person it was to go to by growing warm in their hand. He leaned back against the curricle seat, his arms crossed at his chest. I didn't believe any of it, although it made a wonderful story. But when the woman took the necklace from around her neck and handed it to Guinevere, his voice trailed away. It grew warm. Yes, it was practically glowing. He let out a ragged half-laugh. I know it sounds unbelievable. I remember Morgana was so jealous she practically snatched the necklace from her sister's hand. But it immediately went cold again. Sebastian looked at him sharply. When Sebastian had described the necklace to Morgana, she disclaimed all knowledge of it. Had she simply forgotten the incident, or remembered it all too well? And this woman, she gave Guinevere the necklace? No, that's just it. The last time I saw the necklace, it was still around the Englishwoman's neck, and that was eight or nine years ago. What was her name? The question came out sounding harsher than Sebastian had meant it to. Do you remember? Pardon shook his head. They said she was mistress to a Frenchman, one of Napoleon's generals, I believe. But I don't remember her name. I couldn't even tell you what she looked like. Was she fair? said Sebastian, his chest so tight he found himself scarcely able to breathe. Fine-boned and fair. I'm sorry, said Vardon, the sun golden on his face as he turned to look directly at Sebastian. I don't remember. Chapter 57 Cat's gowns were made by London's most fashionable modistes, her slippers of the finest silk and kid, her chemises trimmed with delicate Belgian lace. But there had been a time when she'd been intimately familiar with London's booming second-hand clothing trade. She'd known who would fence a silk handkerchief, just as she'd known who would give the best price for a stolen watch. Not all the goods in the second-hand clothing trade were stolen. Men and women, fallen on hard times with nothing left to sell, could still sell their own clothes, their appearance becoming ever more ragged as they spiralled down into the gutter. 
Yet such a huge traffic in used items also created a ready market for thieves. Having once been a thief, Cat knew exactly where to go when she decided to track down the dealer who had sold Lady Addison Peebles' green satin ball gown to Guinevere Anglesey's killer. Many of the second-hand clothing dealers had stalls in the rag fair in Rosemary Lane, while others sold their goods from barrows in Whitechapel, with the occasional purloined round of cheese or bacon hidden away beneath the tattered petticoats and breeches. But the finest quality goods could be found in a little shop kept by Mother Keys in Longacre. There, in her elegantly bowed front window, Mother Keys displayed delicate silk handkerchiefs and nightdresses of linen and lace, snowy white kid gloves, and ball gowns fit for a queen. All looked new, although they were not. Some had been sold by their owners or the servants to whom they'd been given. Others had come into the shop by more nefarious channels, with any initials or marks carefully removed before the items were put on display. The bell on the front door jangled pleasantly as Cat entered the shop, bringing with her the warm sense of sun and morning breeze. Mother Keys looked up from behind her counter, her sharp hazel eyes narrowing as they travelled up the length of Cat's fringed and embroidered boudoir walking gown, assessed the package she carried, and came to rest on her face. It had been nearly ten years now since a much younger cat had slipped through Mother Keys's door, and she hadn't been wearing soft kid gloves or a chip hat with a delicately curled ostrich feather that cost enough to feed a family for months. But Cat knew the woman recognized her. Remembering faces and reading the subtle telltale signs of character writ there had kept Mother Keys out of Newgate for sixty years or more. Holding the old woman's gaze, Cat spread the green satin gown on the polished counter between them and said, If I were Abigail to a duke's daughter-in-law, and my lady gave me a gown such as this that she no longer wanted, I think I'd bring it to you to sell. Mother Keys glanced down at the gown, her eyes narrowing, although her face gave nothing away. She was a tiny woman, her frame delicate, the features in her wrinkled face small and even. She looked back up at Cat. Think me a flat, do you? Cat laughed. I know very well you are not. And this maid I'm talking about, the one who sold you this dress? She spoke the truth. Lady Addison Peebles did give her the gown. Her mother-in-law said the colour made her look like a sick frog. Mother Keys blinked. You have the dress? And you know who sold it. So why are you here? Cat laid a guinea on the expanse of shimmering satin. I want to know who bought it. Mother Keys hesitated a moment, then picked up the coin with quick, nimble fingers. I don't know their names, but I do remember them. It didn't surprise Cat. People were Mother Keys' hobby. She amused herself by watching them, studying them, analysing them. They were a queer pair, she said. No doubt about it. She paused expectantly. Cat placed a second coin on the counter. There were two of them. That's right. One of them was from the colonies, the southern colonies from the sound of him. She leaned in close and dropped her voice. An African, no less. Mind you, he was as pale-skinned as a Portuguese, but he had the features, if you know what I mean. That flat nose and them full lips. Big he was, too. And bald as a plucked goose. Cat dutifully deposited another coin. And the other one. What was he like? Not a man. A girl. A London girl. Young she was. No more than fifteen or sixteen, I'd say. Maybe less. Yellow-headed and tall, but otherwise ordinary-looking. I don't remember much else about her, except for her eyes. Her eyes. They were so pale. Reminded me of rainwater on a cloudy day. Nothing there but a reflection. You wouldn't happen to remember anything they said, would you? Mother Keys gazed out the shop window at the troop of soldiers marching past, her lips pursing with sudden thought. 
Well, let me see. Cat placed another coin on the table. The coin disappeared beneath Mother Keys's tiny hand. They argued a bit about the size of the dress. The girl, she kept insisting they needed something bigger, but the African, he said, no, it'd do just fine. And then he said the queerest thing. The old woman paused expectantly. Suppressing a sigh of impatience, Cat produced another coin. Mother Keys drew back her lips in a smile that displayed a mouthful of unexpectedly sound teeth. He said that dress, it was just the thing for a lady to wear to the Brighton Pavilion. Chapter 58 I'd like you to spend some time hanging around Lady Quinlan's house, Sebastian told his tiger after they had returned the Chevalier to St. James's Street. See if you can find out what her ladyship was doing the day Guinevere Anglesey was killed. You think Lady Quinlan offed her own sister? squeaked Tom in surprise. I think I'd like to know what she was doing last Wednesday. I'll find out. Ne'er you fear, promised Tom. Sebastian grunted. And do endeavour not to get picked up by the watch this time, do you hear? I never, Tom began, as they turned onto Brook Street, only to break off and say, Cool, look there. Ain't that Miss Cat? She stood on the footpath before Sebastian's house, the embroidered skirt of her poudre soir walking dress clutched in one hand as she prepared to mount his steps. Cat never came to his house. She said it wasn't appropriate that the time they shared together should be kept separate from the life he lived in Mayfair as the Earl of Hendon's son and Lady Wilcox's brother. She knew it infuriated him, but she wasn't the kind of woman to be intimidated by a man's anger. No matter how much he told her he didn't give a damn about the conventions, that he had only one life and she was a vitally important part of it, she stubbornly stayed away. Only once before had she come here, and then she'd been both unconscious and bleeding. At the sound of the curricle, her head turned, the brim of her chip hat casting the features of her face into shadow. Stable them, he told Tom, handing the boy the reins and jumping lightly from the curricle's high seat. What is it? What's wrong? he asked, his hands clasping Cat's shoulders as she came up to him. She shook her head. Nothing's wrong. I located the second-hand dealer who sold Lady Addison's green satin evening gown. He knew better than to ask how, out of all the second-hand clothing dealers in London, she'd known which one to go to. And? She says she sold it to an African and a tall young girl with pale grey eyes. The girl was easy enough to find. According to one of the men Sebastian came upon sifting through the still-smoking rubble of the Norfolk Arms on Giltspur Street, her name was Amelia Brennan, the eldest of eight children. She lived with her mother and father in a ramshackle, whitewashed cottage built into what had once been the garden of a bigger house facing Cock Lane. The larger houses themselves had long since been broken up into lodgings, their gardens disappearing beneath a warren of shanties and hovels, threaded by a narrow byway half-filled with heaps of ashes and steaming rubbish piles. As Sebastian's carriage turned down the lane, ragged children stared from open windows, their hair tangled and matted, their faces and arms as caked with dirt as newly dug potatoes. Most had probably never seen a lord's carriage with its well-fed, glossy-coated horses, its liveried and powdered footmen standing up behind. They had certainly never seen such a sight here in Hapney Court. Sebastian waited in the carriage while one of the footmen hopped down and went to rap on the Brennan's warped door. The show of ostentatious power and wealth was deliberate, and Sebastian meant to use it to his advantage. The Brennan's cottage was better tended than its neighbours, he noticed, its missing windows covered with oiled parchment rather than simply stuffed with rags, the front step freshly swept. But signs of encroaching decay were evident in the rotting eaves at one corner, in the shutter that hung drunkenly from a broken hinge. A woman answered the door, a boy of about two balanced on one hip. 
she had the worn face and graying hair of an old woman, although considering the age of her children, Sebastian suspected she was only in her mid-thirties. He watched her gaze travel from the powdered footman to the grand carriage filling the lane outside her cottage, and saw the terrible fear that flooded into her eyes. Her lips parted, her arms tightening around the child so that he let out a whimper of protest. Sebastian swung open the carriage door and stepped down with an affected, languid pace, a scented handkerchief held to his nostrils. Your daughter, Amelia, has been implicated in the murder of the Marchioness of Anglesey, he said, his voice at its most patrician and condescending. If she cooperates, I can help her, but only if she cooperates. If she doesn't, it will go hard on her. He let his gaze drift with unmistakable meaning over the humble cottage. On her, and on you, and your other children. Oh, my lord, gushed the woman, sinking to her knees. Our Amelia's a good girl, truly she is. She only did what she was told like a proper servant when... Sebastian cut her off. Is she here now? No, my lord, she's... Get her. A crowd of stair-stepped children filled the open doorway behind the woman. She twisted around, her gaze singling out a thin boy of perhaps eleven or twelve. Normally a lad of that age would be off earning money to help his family. That he was here now suggested that the boy, like his sister, must have worked at the Norfolk Arms. Last night's fire would be hard on this family. Nathan, said the woman, go and be quick. Sebastian watched the boy dash off, then turned back to the woman. I would like to come in and sit down. Mrs. Brennan stumbled to her feet, her thin chest jerking with each rapid breath. Yes, of course, my lord. Please come in. The house was neat and tidy. The dirt floor swept. The walls scrubbed clean. There were two rooms, one above the other, with a steep set of steps along one wall leading up to the second floor where the children doubtless slept. It was a luxury for a family to have two rooms. In some parts of London, families slept twenty and more to a room. Shoving the baby into the arms of a girl of about seven, Amelia's mother showed Sebastian to a settle beside the empty hearth. Fronted by a crude trestle table with benches, the hearth took up most of the back wall. A box bed stood in the far corner, where, in the dim light, Sebastian could make out the huddled shape of a man lying on one side so that he faced the wall. He hurt his legs some months back, said the woman, following Sebastian's gaze. His legs and his head. He hasn't been able to work since. He can't even walk. Which explained the rotting eaves and broken hinge on what had once been a well-tended cottage, Sebastian thought. Without its major wage earner, this was a family sliding toward the edge of disaster. Through the open door at the rear, Sebastian could see a small yard with a wash house and a big copper kettle steaming over a brazier. According to the man at the Norfolk Arms, Amelia's mother worked as a laundress. When she brought him a pot of ale, Sebastian's gaze fell on her cracked, raw hands. A woman could scrub clothes until her hands bled, and still she wouldn't be able to earn enough to feed a family of ten. Our Amelia's a good girl, truly she is, Mrs. Brennan said again her red hands twisting in the cloth of her apron. She was only doing what she was told. Which was? Sebastian cradled the ale pot in his hands, but he was careful not to taste it. Not after what had happened to Guinevere Anglesey in this neighborhood. The click of a woman's patterns on the muddy cobbles outside brought Mrs. Brennan around, her face pinched and anxious. Amelia paused on the threshold of the open door, her hands gripping either side of the frame, her pale eyes widening. At the sight of Sebastian, she whirled to run, then let out a soft cry when Andrew, one of the strapping footmen Sebastian had brought with him, stepped forward to grasp her by the arms. There, there now, miss, said Andrew. I believe his lordship was wishing to speak with you. Chapter 59 Amelia Please, said Mrs. Brennan. She reached out to loop an arm around the neck of one of the younger children, 
and pull him closer to her, as if she might somehow protect him from what was about to happen. Please. Amelia's pale grey eyes met her mother's darker, troubled gaze. She hesitated, then bent to unstrap her patterns. When she straightened, her face was carefully wiped clean of all expression. She came to slide onto the bench on the far side of the table. Four of the younger children crowded around her, their faces solemn as they stared at Sebastian. The girl with the baby hung back against the far wall, but her gaze, like her siblings, was fixed on Sebastian. Only Amelia refused to look at him, her gaze on the table before her. I want you to tell me precisely what happened at the Norfolk Arms last Wednesday, he said to her. I already know about the murder. All I need you to do is confirm the details. She brought up both hands to smooth her lank hair away from the sides of her face. Her expression might be calm, but her hands were shaking. She sucked in a deep breath, her teeth working on her lower lip. I didn't know nothing about it till it was all over. She glanced up at him once quickly, then away. I swear I didn't. We was busy that afternoon, and I was working the common room. Then Mr. Carter, he comes to me and says he wants me to help him buy a dress for... for the lady. Sebastian waited. A quiver of revulsion bordering on horror passed over the girl's face. He wanted me to go with him to make sure he bought the right size. He said she was tall like me, but he made me look at her so I'd be sure. You went with him to Longacre? She nodded. That green gown. I told him it was too small, but he was that set on buying it. He said it was just the thing for... She broke off. For a lady to wear to the Brighton Pavilion. Sebastian finished for her. Her head bowed until he could see the crooked white line of the part in her hair. Her hands clutched together on the worn tabletop. He said it did fit, that her ladyship weren't such a strapping wench as me. Only you were right, weren't you? It was too small. Did they make you wash her ladyship's body and dress her as well? Amelia's gaze flew to her mother. Mrs. Brennan pressed her lips together, then gave a barely perceptible nod of her head. Amelia sucked in another shaky breath. Mum does most of the laying out round here. While Mr. Carter and I was gone, he had Mum brought in to see to the lady. Sebastian glanced at the woman who stood beside the empty hearth, her thin shoulders hunched, her hands clutching her elbows close to her sides. Did he tell you what they intended to do with the body? Sebastian asked. It was Amelia who answered. No, but we heard them talking. They was at the other end of the room arguing, while Mum and I got the lady dressed and finished cleaning up the mess. The mess? In the room where she died. And where was that? The girl's forehead puckered with confusion, as if she'd expected him to know this, since he knew so much else. The best upstairs parlour. Sebastian set aside the untouched pot of ale and pushed to his feet. Tell me about the necklace, he said, the silver necklace with the blue stone disc. Was her ladyship wearing it when you first saw her? Again, that furtive exchange of glances between mother and daughter. No, it was on the floor underneath her, said Amelia. Mum found it when she was cleaning her up. The clasp was bent a bit, but I was able to straighten it out enough so as we could get it back on her. And then what did you do? Amelia swallowed. We rolled the lady up inside a length of canvas, and Mr. Carter and me carried her down the back steps and out into the alley. They had a cart waiting. What kind of a cart? Amelia lifted one shoulder in a shrug. Just a cart, like the ironmongers use. It was empty, except for some canvas bags filled with ice, and a big chest. A chest? That's right. One of them fancy Chinese chests with black lacquer were all covered with paintings of dragons and trees picked out in yellow and red. Sebastian gave a wry smile. He remembered noticing the chest when he looked round the yellow cabinet in the pavilion. He'd seen the chest and hadn't given it a second thought. The prince was always ordering cartfuls of oddities and trifles for the pavilion. 
No one would question or even remember the delivery of yet another Chinese lacquered wood chest. While the ice... The ice could very well have come from the inn's own cellars. It wasn't so uncommon these days. The extra cold would have delayed the onset of rigor mortis enough for Guinevere's killers to haul her body down to Brighton in the cart, then stuff her into the chest and carry her into the pavilion. Yet all those hours in the cart had left their mark in the pattern of lividity Paul Gibson had identified so accurately on Guinevere's body, just as the passing of the hours had left their own signs, signs that could be read by those who knew how to interpret them. But whoever had killed Guinevere Anglesey and conspired to implicate the Prince Regent in her murder hadn't known about those signs, hadn't known that their victim's very body would betray them. Who else came to the inn that afternoon? Sebastian asked aloud. Do you remember? Amelia shook her head, her face confused, as if she couldn't quite understand where he was going with the question. The usual crowd? The common room was full. I'm not talking about the common room. I'm interested in anyone who might have gone upstairs. I wouldn't know about that. Like I said, we was busy. You didn't see a young gentleman? A handsome young gentleman with dark eyes and light brown hair? No, I told you. I didn't see nobody. The girl was becoming agitated, her back held tight, her eyes wide. Sebastian eased up on her. Several nights ago. Some men unloaded a cargo into the inn cellars. One of them was a gentleman, a thin man with longish blonde hair. Do you know who he was? No. Sebastian pressed his hands flat on the tabletop and leaned into them, his arms straight. The woman whose murder you helped to conceal was a marchioness, the marchioness of Anglesey. Did you know that? Amelia looked up at him her chest rising and falling with her quick breathing. But we didn't do nothing. She scrambled up from the bench and backed away from him. We only did what we was told. It's enough to get you hanged, you and your mother both. Sebastian's gaze swept the huddled, silent children. And then what will become of them? The woman beside the empty hearth let out a sharp cry. Sebastian didn't even glance her way. Amelia covered her mouth with one hand, her eyes squeezing shut. Then her hand slipped away and her eyes opened slowly. I've seen him around the inn a few times, she said, meeting Sebastian's compelling gaze. But I don't know his name. I swear to God I don't. He usually comes with his lordship. His lordship? They was both there that day. I thought you knew. He's the one brought the cart. Sebastian searched her face, looking for signs of deceit. You're certain this other man was a lord? Her head nodded vigorously up and down. A tall gentleman with red hair. Lord, I can't remember it exactly. It's like that stone they use. You know the one. They use it for all the grand buildings. Portland? Yes, that's it. Lord Portland. Chapter 60 Intent on intercepting the Home Secretary before he left Whitehall for the Regent's Fete, Sebastian directed his coachman toward Westminster. The shadows were only just beginning to lengthen toward evening. The Regent's first guests wouldn't be arriving for hours. But the streets were already packed with crowds surging toward Carlton House in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the exiled French royal family and two thousand noblemen and women arriving at what was being called the grandest, most extravagant sit-down dinner in the history of the European monarchy. By the time Sebastian's carriage had passed Temple Bar and swung onto the Strand, the horses were barely moving. They sidled nervously in their traces, the lightly sprung coach rocked from side to side by the jostling crowd. Sebastian threw open the door. Get the carriage out of this, he shouted to his coachman. I'll make better time on foot. Yes, my lord. Leaving the carriage awash in a sea of ragged humanity, Sebastian threaded his way through a crowd that grew increasingly surly as he neared Somerset House. They say they's gonna let us in tomorrow to look at the place, yelled one man. Them knobs, 
They get to eat and drink their fill. All we get to do is look. Here, here, murmured a score of men near him. Sebastian pushed on, aware of the sullen looks being cast his way. He found himself regretting the exquisitely cut coat of fine blue cloth, the skin-tight leather breeches and shining top boots that unmistakably marked him as a gentleman. Prinny had planned this fete as a grand celebration of the inauguration of his regency. But it occurred to Sebastian, as he looked into the sweating, bitter faces around him, that the prince had misjudged his populace. People were angry, resentful. Tomorrow, the prince would again leave London for Brighton. What better time, thought Sebastian, to stage a coup? Someone up ahead began to sing. Nor a fatter fish than he flounders round the polar sea. An ugly chorus of jeers swelled through the crowd. A dozen more voices took up the ditty. See his blubber and his gills. What a world of drinky swills. Oi, who do you think you're shoving there? growled a voice behind Sebastian. Sebastian threw a glance over his shoulder. A dark-haired man with a craggy face, lips peeled back and jaw set in determination, was pushing his way through the crowd, his gaze fixed on Sebastian. The mob surged, hemming in Sebastian. Craggy face lunged, his right hand fisted around a dagger. Sebastian tried to feint to the left, but the crowd was too close. The searing edge of the blade slid across his ribs, slicing through coat, waistcoat and shirt to nick the flesh beneath. Every fish of generous kind, sang the throng, scuds aside or shrinks behind. Bloody hell, swore Sebastian, bringing the edge of his hand chopping down on the man's wrist. You've ruined another of my coats. Craggy face yelped, his fist reflexively opened to drop the knife into a scuffle of rough-booted feet. But about his presence keep, roared the crowd, all the monsters of the deep. The man grabbed for Sebastian's arm. Cupping his left hand over his right fist, Sebastian drove his elbow back into Craggy Face's stomach. The man's eyes flared wide, the breath gusting out of his pursed lips as he doubled over. He stumbled back, careening into a carpenter's apprentice in a paper cap. Hey, what the hell? the apprentice swore, his fists coming up. Twisting around, Sebastian scanned the sweat-sheened, hostile sea of faces around him lit now by the rich golden light of a fading day. His head swam with the close-packed odours of sun-baked stone and brick, of hot men and foul breath. He saw a clean-shaven man with dark hair and a patrician nose, and recognised him from the alley near the Norfolk Arms. Then Sebastian's gaze locked with a hard grey stare of a man whose auburn head towered above the ragged crowd. The Earl of Portland wore the dark, unassuming coat of a man who was dressed with the intent of not calling attention to himself. At his side, Sebastian glimpsed a familiar, half-grown lad, Nathan Brennan from Hakeney Court. Bloody hell, Sebastian swore under his breath. How many more were there? A fat baker with greying whiskers threw back his head and sang, Name or title, what has he? Is he regent of the sea? Sebastian cast a quick glance up the strand. The crowd ahead was too thick, too hostile for Sebastian to have any hope of pushing his way through it. He began to slip sideways, edging his way toward a narrow lane he could see opening up just beyond the alehouse on his right. By his bulk and by his size, sang the crowd, their voices swelling toward the punchline. By his oily qualities. Slipping between a fishmonger and a tattered beggar, Sebastian reached the corner. The side streets here lay in shadow, the shops already shuttered out of fear of the restive throng. Without looking back, Sebastian darted down the lane. This or else my eyesight fails, roared the mass of voices. This should be the Prince of Wales. Sebastian heard a shout go up from behind him, followed by a chorus of angry protests from the crowd as his pursuers pushed their way forward. Chapter 61 The cobbled lane stretched straight before him. 
Throwing a quick glance over his shoulder, Sebastian took the first alley that opened up to his left. Already he could hear the sound of running feet behind him. He quickly ducked down another byway. He hoped to lose himself in the warren of mean streets that ran between Bedford Street and St. Martin's Lane, but the area was unfamiliar to him. Dodging the low-hung, swinging sign of a shuttered gin shop, he rounded a corner and found himself in a cul-de-sac. Ancient, soot-stained brick buildings rose around him three and more stories. He was trapped. He spun around, his breath sawing in and out of his heaving chest. Several doors opened onto the pavement, but all were padlocked from the outside. The slap of running feet grew nearer. Impossible to go back now. His gaze fell to the arched entrance of the culvert at his feet. Once the arch had been barred by an iron grill, but now the grill was rusted and broken, the bars twisted apart to make a space wide enough for a man to slip through. He'd heard tales of men who made their living by scavenging the honeycomb of ancient viaducts and sewers that ran beneath the streets of London. Toshers, they were called. The work was dangerous. The vaults flooded quickly with the rising tide of the river into which they emptied, or even from a heavy storm that could pass unnoticed by those toiling away below ground. There were deadly gases, too, that could overcome the unwary. Sometimes the floor of one tunnel would collapse into an older vault that ran below it, the sinkhole covered by deceptively flat expanses of silt that only betrayed themselves when a man stepped onto their smooth, deadly surface. This way, someone shouted. Bloody hell, swore Sebastian. Rolling into the gutter, he squeezed his way through the grill, the rusted bars scraping his wounded side as he lowered himself into the shaft. He felt his coat catch on one of the bars and pulled it sharply, swearing again when he heard the cloth rip. Scrabbling around for the iron rings driven into the brickwork of the shaft, he lowered himself into the darkness. Some six or eight feet down, his legs plunged into the void of a vault. He let go, dropping the last four or five feet into a noisome stretch of mud and muck that splashed beneath his feet as he landed. The close, foul stench of the place pinched at his nostrils, roiled his stomach. Panting heavily, he paused to give his eyes time to adjust to the darkness, and heard a voice from the street above say, Where the devil did he go? Sebastian held himself very still. There, he heard Portland say, He's gone down the culvert. See? There was a dull twang of metal. He's torn his coat. You, Rory, fetch some lanterns and be quick about it. Sweet bleeding, Jesus, said a man's gruff voice. I ain't going down there. People die down there. You fool, spat Portland. If we don't find him and stop him, we'll all be dead. Now get going. Setting his teeth against the stench, Sebastian slipped away from the shaft. He could see better now, his eyes growing accustomed to the dim light that filtered down through the occasional grates. He was in a brickwork tunnel that arched so low over his head he had to stoop to keep from scraping his crown against the curving roof. A slow trickle of water ran down the centre of the tunnel, but he suspected it wouldn't be enough to wash away all trace of his footprints. If Portland and his men could find lanterns, the direction Sebastian had taken would be all too easy to see. The uneven, muck-covered bricks were treacherous beneath his feet. Moving as quickly as he dared, he followed the water downhill, hoping to come across another open grate that would give him access to the streets above. But he'd gone no more than a few hundred feet when he heard the sound of splashing and men's voices behind him, followed by a wavering gleam of light. Rory had found lanterns far quicker than Sebastian would have expected. Devlin! Portland's voice echoed through the shadowy tunnel. Devlin! I know you can hear me. Sebastian paused, listening. You won't get far down here, Devlin. Not without a lantern. It'll be dark soon. Is this what you want? To die in a sewer like a rat? For what? For a shrieking madman of a king and his bloated buffoon of a son? A silence fell, filled with the drip of water and the furtive scurrying of unseen rat's feet. Portland's voice came again. You know what we're doing is right, Devlin. You saw what it was like up there. The people of England have had enough. They're restless, angry. If we don't act now, the people themselves will bring down the monarchy. 
Only they won't just sweep away this king, this regent. It'll be the end of us all. We know what happened in France. Is that what you want? To see England a republic? With a guillotine in Charing Cross and every man, woman, and child of noble birth a target? Sebastian could feel the damp chill of the place seeping up through the soles of his boots and wrapping around him like a fetid embrace. He glanced up at the rough bricks overhead and tried not to think about the crushing weight of the tons of earth above him. Join us, Portland was saying. You know what we want. A strong England, a strong monarchy. It can happen. All it takes is a few selfless, determined men in the right places. Tomorrow the regent leaves for Brighton. We will simply seize control in his absence. Declare for Anne of Savoy and her husband, and present the world with a fait accompli. What can Prinny do, march on London? It won't happen. What regiment would follow him? It'll be the bloodless revolution of 1811. Join us, Devlin. It will be a historic moment. The Home Secretary fell silent. There, said a man's gruff voice, cutting through the darkness. See the footprints? He's headed toward the river. Sebastian splashed forward, heedless now of the noise he made. His feet slipped in the muck, his head brushing the rough bricks above. He could hear Portland and his men behind him, their feet slapping in the mud, their voices breathless. The feeble light from their lanterns bounced and flickered over the tunnel's damp-stained walls, chasing him. Round a long bend he came upon another tunnel that angled away uphill to his right. This tunnel was both higher roofed and broader than the one he followed, and for a moment he considered taking it. He'd long ago lost all sense of orientation, but when he hesitated at the junction, the air of the wider tunnel lay still and dead in the darkness, while a faint stirring of air seemed to waft up from below. He followed the air. Before he turned away from the intersection, Sebastian was careful to leave the sides of the tunnel and deliberately wade out into the sluggish stream that now trickled down the centre. The water was deeper here. It would hide his footprints, mask his choice of direction. Debris fouled water swirled around his boots, slowing his steps and growing higher by the minute. He dared not move too quickly now. The least sound would betray the direction he had chosen. He covered another two hundred feet, three. Then the lights behind him wavered, and the splashing, scrabbling sounds quieted. Sebastian immediately drew up, holding himself perfectly still. He could hear his own breath soughing painfully in and out, so loud in his ears he wondered Portland and his men couldn't hear it. Son of a bitch, swore Portland. Which way did he go? Sebastian breathed through his mouth, trying to block the stench of the place. The bloated carcass of a dead dog floated beside him. Glancing around the damp, cramped vault, he became aware of myriad eyes staring at him, glowing pinpricks of light in the darkness. More rats, he realized. Scores and scores of rats. We'll have to split up, he heard Portland say. Bedlow, you and Hank keep going ahead. Rory, you come with me. The splashing started up again. Cautiously, Sebastian pushed on, but he had to move more quietly than before, lest the two men still behind him become alerted to his presence and call the others back. The tunnel he followed angled downward, becoming both broader and wider as he neared the river. He could move more easily now, walking upright rather than stooping, but the water at his feet was rising, lapping at the tops of his boots, splashing up on his thighs. He became aware of the sound of rushing water coming from up ahead. A cold draught wafted toward him, carrying a different smell, the salty scent of the river mingling now with the acrid stench of sulphur and decay. Rounding a bend, Sebastian could see that up ahead the tunnel he followed emptied into a larger vault. Wider and flatter than the sewer he followed, the larger tunnel looked old, probably dating back to medieval times. Built of stone rather than brick, its centre formed a deep culvert through which rushed a wide stream of water flowing so fast it filled the air with a soft mist. Just before its junction with the older sewer, the tunnel Sebastian followed opened out into a broad basin so wide the water only ran down the middle, 
with flat banks of deep mud stretching out to either side. Finding a shallow embrasure in the brick wall beside him, Sebastian drew back into the shadows, easing the dagger from his boot, and waited for the two men following him to come abreast. He didn't have long to wait. The patrician-nosed gentleman Sebastian had seen in Smithfield passed first. Bledlow, Portland had called him. He carried the lantern thrust out before him at the end of a straight arm that shook so violently the light wobbled drunkenly over the curving walls and ceiling. Sebastian held himself very still and let the first man pass. The handle of the knife felt smooth and hard against Sebastian's palm the chill from the dank earth around him seeping through his sweat-dampened clothes. He waited until the second man, the dark-haired, craggy-faced assailant from the Strand, had taken one step, two, beyond the embrasure. The man moved clumsily, the scuffling of his feet on the slimy, uneven brick making enough noise to cover the whisper of sound as Sebastian slipped from the embrasure. Catching the second man from behind, Sebastian clamped his left hand over the man's mouth and slit his throat, the blade slicing swift and sure. The man died instantly. Sebastian quietly eased the body down to the muddy bricks at his feet. But something in the man's pocket clunked against the ground loud enough to bring the first man, Bledlow, around. Oh, my God, he yelped. Swinging the lantern like a weapon, Bledlow charged. Ducking the edge of the lantern, Sebastian sideswept the lunge. His foot slipped on the slimy bricks, and he went down on one knee, the knife spinning out of his hand. Whirling around, Bledlow charged again, the lantern still gripped in one fist. Crouching, Sebastian fell back and used the man's own momentum to roll him over one shoulder with a heave that sent Bledlow lurching out into the broad mud of the basin. The lantern flew through the air and splashed into the water, going out. The tunnel plunged into near darkness. Sebastian heard a deep subterranean rumbling. The mud heaved, sucking Bledlow down. Help! The man floundered in the mud, sinking deeper to his hips now in the oozing muck. For God's sake, help me! Sebastian hesitated. He even took an unthinking step off the brick onto the treacherous sucking mud. But the man had stumbled far out into the muddy basin. Even if Sebastian were to throw himself flat across the unstable silt, his outstretched arms still would not grasp the doomed man's flailing hands. Sebastian felt the earth shift ominously beneath him. He leapt back. From far down the tunnel came the echo of a shout and the flicker of a lantern. Portland. Quit struggling and try to keep still, Sebastian said, although he knew the man was beyond listening, beyond reason. Already the mud had sucked him down to his neck. He was screaming the shrieks punctuated with quick, gasping sobs. Sebastian regained his footing on the brick and broke into a run. Chapter 62 The light filtering down through the gratings had dimmed with the approach of evening. Soon, Sebastian realized, it would be night, and with the fall of night would come the rising tide. Reaching the main culvert, Sebastian turned left, moving away from the river. The water here was already running deep and swift enough to carry a man away. He kept to the narrow, elevated footpath that ran beside the chasm. But the path was treacherous, its stones broken and crumbling, forcing him to slow down. It wasn't long before he saw the flare of a light behind him, heard Portland's loud, angry voice, Leave him! There's nothing you can do for him! The man's dead! Sebastian pushed on. At one point he came upon a broad shaft opening to the street above, with a sturdy iron ladder firmly bolted to the damp stone walls. Taking a chance, Sebastian scrambled up the ladder to find the bars of the culvert above soundly in position. Conscious of the passing of precious seconds, he dropped back down and kept going. A quarter of a mile or so farther on, he came to a place where a side tunnel had collapsed into the main vault bringing down a heap of rubble and dirt that formed a makeshift dam. Water shot over the lip of the cave-in like a waterfall, but when he scrambled to the top of the tumulus, Sebastian found a broad expanse of water that had backed up behind the debris. A subterranean lake stretched from one side of the vault to the other, submerging the footpaths on either side. Well, hell. 
The light was fading fast. The dam alive with rats scuttled, screeching across the refuse at his feet. Reaching down to pick up a stout branch, he found himself staring at the pale body of a newborn baby, mixed up with the carcasses of dead cats and dogs, and the broken chairs and filthy twisted rags that had snagged on the rubble. The stench here was almost overwhelming. Moving gingerly in the near darkness, Sebastian lowered himself into the cold, murky water on the far side of the dam. His cravat wasn't exactly white anymore, but he tore it off anyway, and buttoned up his dark coat to hide the betraying gleam of his silk waistcoat. Scooping up a fistful of muck, he smeared his face with mud. Then he settled down to wait, the branch held ready. The glow of the lantern grew closer. He heard a man say, Oh, God, in a voice half strangled by disgust. Rats, oh, look what they're eating. Here, snapped Portland, give me the lantern. Sebastian could see him now, the light from the battered tin lantern wobbling over the vaulted ceiling of the sewer as he clambered across the debris. The Home Secretary's hat was gone, his once fine coat torn and muddied. A jagged scrape trickled blood down one cheek. At the top of the dam, he paused. Mother of God, it's a lake, said the other man coming up beside him. We can't get across that. Devlin obviously did. You don't know that. Maybe he drowned. He didn't drown. Perching the lantern on the end of an outthrust slab of rubble, Portland waded into the lake. The water swelled up over his boots until it was lapping at his thighs, then his hips. As he lifted his arms above the dark water, Sebastian could see the pistol stuck in the waistband of his breeches. Hidden behind a pile of trash, Sebastian sank lower in the water and let him pass. The other man hesitated, then scampered after him. He was reaching back to grab the lantern when Sebastian rose like a spectre from the water, the branch gripped in both hands. The man's eyes widened, his lips parting in a high-pitched shriek. Sebastian put the entire weight of his body into the swing and sent the wood smashing into the man's legs. The crack of breaking bone echoed around the shadowy, lamp-lit vault. The man screamed in pain, his legs buckling beneath him. Sebastian swung again as the man splashed into the water, the branch splintering in Sebastian's hands as it shattered against the man's head. Portland turned, moving awkwardly in the waist-deep water. Jevlin! The other man's body floated between them, face down. Portland surged forward, wading into the shadows. Smiling grimly, he reached to snatch the pistol from his waistband. He held it out in a steady grip, the dark bore of the barrel pointed at Sebastian's chest. You lose, my friend, he said, and pulled the trigger. Sebastian listened to the click of the locking mechanism striking steel and smiled. Powder doesn't like to get wet, you son of a bitch. Portland's nostrils flared, his lips pressing together in a tight, grim line. Shifting his grip on the pistol, he swung it over his head like a club and lunged at Sebastian. Dodging sideways, Sebastian felt the slime-coated rubble shift beneath his feet. He lost his balance and plunged deep, sucking in a quick breath just before the water closed over his head. He had to fight his way to the surface, the ground beneath his feet still treacherous. Breaking water, he found Portland there before him. The Home Secretary raised the pistol to bring it down on Sebastian's head again, the barrel blue-black in the faint glow of the lantern, the dark, polished wood of the handle dripping water. Sebastian still gripped the splintered remains of his cudgel in his fist, and he used it now like a dagger, driving it up into Portland's gut just as the man leapt. Portland's eyes flew open wide, a gasp coming from the back of his throat as the jagged wood thrust deep into his stomach. Sebastian took a quick step back. The man's legs collapsed beneath him. He sank quickly, the lake closing over his head, his body sucked along by the current so that Sebastian had to dive into the murky water to find him. Fisting his hands in Portland's coat, Sebastian hauled the man out of the water and dragged him up onto the pile of rubble. Why, Guinevere Anglesey, Sebastian said with a gasp, dropping down beside him. Why did she have to die? Portland's eyes were open, his chest jerking with each breath. 
Vardon was careless, he said, his voice a hoarse whisper. He let her find the letter. Water dripped down Sebastian's cheeks, ran into his eyes. He swiped at his face with one wet sleeve. What letter? A letter from Savoy? Vardon. He swore she wouldn't tell anyone, but we couldn't take the chance. So you lured her to the Norfolk Arms and killed her? No, not me. Portland shook his head, the movement causing his chest to heave as he fell to coughing. Carter needed help getting the body out of his inn. It was my idea to use her death to— His face twisted in a spasm of pain. To discredit the prince. It was working, too, until you interfered. What are you saying, that Carter killed her? Portland's eyelids flickered closed. Sebastian gripped the man's shoulders, shaking him. Damn you! Who killed her? Portland's jaw had gone slack. Pressing his fingers to the side of the man's neck, Sebastian caught the thread of a pulse. A man could live for hours, even days, with a gut wound. Sebastian sat back on his heels, his gaze on the man before him. If he tried to haul the Home Secretary out of the sewers by himself, he'd simply kill the man. Slipping his hands beneath Portland's shoulders, Sebastian dragged the man's limp body to the highest point of the landslide, where he'd hopefully be safe from the rising tide. He left in the lantern, too, in case Portland should come back to consciousness. Then he retraced his route to the surface. It was an hour or more before Sebastian and a troop of constables made it back to the ancient stone-walled sewer, the lights from their lanterns reflecting eerily off the dark walls and high, soaring ceiling. But when they reached the site of the cave-in, the Home Secretary was gone. Standing at the top of the pile of rubble, Sebastian looked out across the dark expanse of water. The body of the other man he'd killed lay half-submerged at the base of the rubble but the Home Secretary still floated, his body lying face down in the subterranean lake. I don't understand it, said the Chief Constable, coming to stand beside Sebastian. The rocks aren't wet here. The tide couldn't have come high enough to carry him off. So what happened? Sebastian stared down at the smear of blood that led to the water's edge and said nothing. Chapter 63 Sebastian limped across the black and white marble floor of his entry hall, his boots squishing foul-smelling water with each step. His cravat and hat were gone, his breeches and coat ripped and smeared with malodorous muck. His valet would likely succumb to a fit of the vapours at the sight of him. Morrie hovered near the door, careful not to approach too near. Send Sedlo to me right away, said Sebastian, moving toward the stairs. I regret to have to inform your lordship that Sedlo resigned his post this afternoon, said the majordomo in a wooden voice. Sebastian paused, then gave a soft laugh. Of course. I'll have to make do with one of the footmen. I need a hot bath. Quickly. Yes, my lord. Mori gave a stately bow and withdrew. Sebastian, having bathed, was slavering a herb-rich ointment from the apothecaries onto his various cuts and scrapes when Tom knocked at his dressing-room door. I've got what you wanted on that Lady Quinlan, said the boy, giving Andrew the footman the puzzled look. Yes, said Sebastian, not turning around. She had a scientific demonstration at her house on Wednesday last. Some gent with a bunch of glass tubes full of queer-coloured liquids that foamed and smoked. The downstairs maid said she was afeard they'd blow the place sky higher before they was done. Her ladyship was there all afternoon. She even helped mix the chemicals herself. Tom paused, his nose wrinkling. What's that smell? The sewers, said Sebastian, pulling a fine shirt over his head. Tom accepted this without comment. You don't look surprised, the boy said, sounding rather disappointed. No. I already know who killed Guinevere Anglesey.
Sebastian arrived at Curzon Street to find Audley House standing dark and quiet in the moonlight. Wearing the elegant knee breeches and long-tailed coat of evening dress, he climbed the shallow steps to the front door and found it unlatched. He hesitated a moment, listening to the stillness. Then he pushed the heavy door open and went inside. Stepping into the darkened hall, he followed the faint flicker of candlelight that showed from the back of the house. The light came from the library, where a single candelabra had been lit upon the mantelpiece. The chevalier stood beside it, his back to the door as he worked, assembling papers from the desk. Your servants seem to have disappeared, said Sebastian, leaning against the door jamb. At the sound of Sebastian's voice, the chevalier started violently. He swung around, his pale face drawn and tense. My mother dismissed them all this afternoon. Going away, are you? Vardon turned back to the desk. I am. Yes. The Earl of Portland is dead. Good, said Vardon, shoving the papers into a satchel that lay open upon the desk. Sebastian pushed away from the door and walked into the room. He didn't kill her. I know. Sebastian went to stand before the empty fireplace, his gaze on the flickering candle flames reflected in the mirror above the mantel. Tell me about the Savoy letter. How much do you know? About the plan to oust the regent? Not much. What concerns me now is what happened to Guinevere Anglesey. How did she end up with the letter? He thought for a moment that the Chevalier didn't mean to answer. Then the man turned away from the desk, his hands coming up to press flat against his face, his chest rising as he sucked in a deep breath. The Saturday before she died, we met at an inn near Richmond. I see. Bardon let his hands fall, scrubbing them across his face. I know what you're thinking. But it wasn't like that. Once she'd conceived the child, we met only as friends. She said anything else would be disloyal to Anglesey. We spent that Saturday wandering through the park, then ordered tea in a private parlour at the local inn. I'd been out late the night before, and what with all the fresh air and the exercise, I fell asleep in the chair. I'd taken off my coat and tossed it aside. His lips quirked up into a soft smile that faded almost instantly. Gwyn was always so tidy. She picked up the coat, meaning to straighten it. The letter simply fell out of the pocket. She read it. Yes. It wasn't like her to do something like that. I think she must have been suspicious of some of the things she knew I'd been doing lately. When she saw the Savoy seal, well, she simply couldn't resist. She confronted you. Vardon nodded. When I awoke. He went to stand beside the library's long table, one hand fiddling with the tumble of books scattered across the gleaming wood. She was horrified at the thought of what we were planning to do. I still don't understand it. She never had anything but disdain for the House of Hanover. There was even a family legend that some great-great-grandmother of hers had once been mistress to James II. But all she could talk about was the miseries of war we'd be visiting on the people, and the danger to me, of course. I tried to make her see that getting rid of the Prince Regent was the only thing that could save England, keep it from going down the same path of violent revolution as the French. She didn't believe it. No. He let out his breath in a long sigh, as if he'd been holding it for a lifetime. I'll never forget the way she looked at me. As if I were a stranger, someone she'd never seen before. Why did she take the letter? Sebastian asked softly. I honestly don't think she meant to. She'd thrown it away from her when we were arguing, as if it were some vile thing she couldn't bear to touch. The only thing I can figure is... It must have fallen into the folds of her cloak. She didn't put the cloak on when she left, just snatched it up and ran out. I didn't realize the letter was missing until after she had gone. Surely you didn't think she would betray you? No. But when I tried to contact her, she refused to see me. I had to practically accost her in the street one morning when she was on her way to ride in the park. She swore she'd destroyed the letter as soon as she discovered she still had it. He paused, 
his throat working as he swallowed. And then she told me she never wanted to see me again. Sebastian studied the young man's taut profile. But when you told your mother the letter had been destroyed, she didn't believe you? His face contorted with pain. No. And so your mother wrote Guinevere a note in your hand, asking her to bring the letter to Smithfield. Only Guinevere didn't bring the letter. She couldn't, because she'd already destroyed it. But your mother killed her anyway. Yes, said Vardon, in a torn whisper. She said she couldn't allow Guinevere to live. Not with what she knew. When did you put it all together? This afternoon, when I saw the note. And you told me about the necklace. I came home and confronted her. She didn't even try to deny it. She said she'd done it for me. He dragged in a ragged breath that shuddered his chest. God help me. She did it for me. Your father was related to the House of Savoy? Fardon swung his head to look at Sebastian through narrowed eyes. Yes, although not to the Stuarts. How did you know? Something you said to me once, about impoverished royal relatives. What did they promise you in return for your support? A rich wife? A faint touch of colour stained the ridges of his high cheekbones. Yes. No wonder Guinevere never wanted to see you again. Well, what the devil was I supposed to do? demanded Vardon, pushing away from the window. Spend the rest of my life in poverty, waiting for Anglesey to die? The man could live another twenty or thirty years. Or he could be dead before the end of the summer. Rodin's head jerked back as if he'd been slapped. She never told me that. The first I knew of it was from you. He let out a low, harsh laugh. Do you know what she said to me the last time I saw her? She said she was glad her father had refused to let her marry me. She said, she said she'd loved me all her life, but now she realized that the boy she'd loved had grown up to be less of a man than the husband she'd married. The silence of the house seemed to stretch around them, thick and ominous. Your mother, said Sebastian. Where is she? Upstairs. Sebastian turned toward the door then paused to look back at the man who still stood beside the desk, one fist clenched around the handles of the satchel. This conspiracy against the prince. Who else was involved besides Portland? I don't know. Portland was the contact between Savoy and the others. He kept their identities secret. Sebastian nodded. It might be a lie, but he doubted it. Men in positions of power were typically very, very careful about committing themselves to treason. What will you do? Bardon twitched one shoulder. Go to the continent. To Savoy. Perhaps. Or perhaps I'll go to France. Make my peace with Napoleon. He cast Sebastian a penetrating look from beneath dark, heavy brows. You don't feel it incumbent upon you to attempt to stop me? No, but others will doubtless feel differently. Sebastian turned again toward the stairs. I suggest you lose no time in reaching the coast. Chapter 64 A gentlewoman never lay upon her bed until it was time to retire for the night. For spells of faintness and periods of rest, a lady of quality had a small daybed in her dressing room. And so Sebastian found Lady Audley there, on a Grecian-style couch upholstered in green velvet. She wore an evening dress of black silk richly embroidered and trimmed with Chantilly lace, and had loosened her hair so that it spread out on the pillow round her face like a bright flame. Her breathing was already slowed, her cheeks pale. Whining softly on the carpet beside her lay the collie bitch, Chloe. What did you take? asked Sebastian, pausing just inside the doorway. Cyanide. Her gaze flickered toward him. No, opiates. I will simply go to sleep and never awake. 
It's a far kinder death than the one you gave Guinevere. With Guinevere, I needed something that would act quickly. He walked into the room. The collie stretched to her feet and padded up to him, sniffing. He crouched down to stroke her soft coat. How did you know it was me? Isolde asked when he remained silent. It was the necklace, wasn't it? The necklace and the note. And the certainty that had Claire been the killer, Portland would never have disclaimed responsibility for Guinevere's death. The note? Isolde moved her head restlessly against the pillow. That I hadn't anticipated. What woman doesn't destroy a note from her lover? Yet you sent someone to search her rooms for it after her death. No. He was looking for the Savoy letter. That she did destroy. With a whine, the collie returned to its mistress's side. Isolde reached out to rest one hand on her neck. Vardon confronted me, after you spoke with him. The note I could have denied, but not the necklace. She gave a soft laugh. How ironic. It was supposed to bring its owner long life. Instead, it has brought me death. Sebastian stretched to his feet. But it wasn't meant for you, was it? It had once belonged to one of Guinevere's great-grandmothers. That woman you met in the south of France asked you to give it to Guinevere, didn't she? But you kept it instead. Isolde's voice sharpened. That necklace has power. I could feel it when I held it in my hand. Power. I didn't often wear it. It was enough for me simply to have it. Her tongue darted out to moisten her dry lips. Now it's gone, and I am dead. So is Guinevere. For a moment, the serene features of Isolde's face contorted with a quiver of rage and hatred so fierce it took him by surprise. She would have ruined everything. Everything I worked so hard to bring about. Sebastian shook his head. She loved Vardon. She would never have destroyed him. Yet she did destroy him, in the end. No. Sebastian turned toward the door. You've done that. You've destroyed Vardon and Claire both. Claire knew nothing of this, nothing. And Portland. Portland was a fool. He heard her suck in a gasping breath and turned to look back at her. She was almost gone now. I've never understood why you interfered in all this, she said hoarsely. The woman with the necklace, said Sebastian. Lady Audley's lips parted, her delicately arched brows twitching together in the ghost of a frown. I don't understand. She was my mother. Dressed in a splendid scarlet uniform with a sabre at his side, the Prince Regent was having a rollicking good time. He was a marvellous host. Everyone said so. People were always praising him for his generosity and congeniality. The ballroom was so crowded that no one could actually dance, but that didn't matter. The orchestra played gamely on while the guests amused themselves by taking in the wonders of his most recent architectural improvements to Carlton House. He'd heard gasps of awe provoked by the grandeur of the throne room, with its curtained bays and gilded columns, its rich red brocades and massively carved chairs. The circular dining room, with its mirrored walls reflecting a two-hundred-foot table that stretched out into the conservatory, was sure to be the talk of the town for weeks to come. At half-past two, supper would be announced, and then everyone would marvel at the real serpentine stream he'd had confected to run down the centre of his table and meander around the massive silver tureens and serving dishes. Flowing between banks built up from moss and rocks with real flowers and miniature bridges, the river featured live gold and silver fish and created an amazing spectacle. He just hoped the fish didn't start dying. Looking out across a garden filled with flambeaux and Chinese lanterns, 
George felt a thrill of pride. For those guests not fortunate enough to sit at the prince's table, there was an enormous supper tent festooned with gilded ropes and flowers. Then his gaze fell on the tall, dark figure working his way through the crowds, and George's smile slipped. Viscount Devlin was correctly, even exquisitely attired in evening dress, with knee breeches and silver buckled shoes. But heads still turned his way, and conversations lagged when he walked past. We need to talk, said the Viscount, coming up to where George's cousin Jarvis stood chatting with the Comte de Lille. Good God, said Jarvis with a laugh. Not now. Devlin's smile never slipped, but his terrible yellow eyes narrowed in a way that sent a shiver up George's spine and had him groping for his smelling salts. Now, said Devlin. It would have been considerably more convenient, said Jarvis, producing an enameled gold snuff-box from his pocket and flipping it open with one practised finger. If you could have discovered Lady Anglesey had been killed by a jealous lover. We can hardly tell people this tale now, can we? Sebastian simply stared at him. They were in a small withdrawing room set apart from the main state apartments in Carlton House. But the voices and laughter of the prince's two thousand guests, the hurried footsteps of the servants, the clink of fine china and glassware, were like a roar around them. Jarvis lifted a pinch of snuff to one nostril. We'll have to place the blame on Vardon. Sebastian gave a short laugh. Why not? It worked with Pierpont. Whatever would we do without the French? Jarvis sniffed. You didn't, by any chance, come upon the names of the other conspirators? No, but there are others. You can be certain of that. Yes. Jarvis dusted his fingers. I doubt they'll make a move in the immediate future, however. Not after this. Particularly if we shift the regiments around and keep the prince here in London. The prince wouldn't be happy with the change of plans, Sebastian knew. His Royal Highness was already fretting, anxious to return to Brighton. The people of Brighton didn't tend to boo him when he drove down the street the way they did in London. And the necklace, said Jarvis. Did you ever discover how Lady Anglesey came to be wearing it? There was something in the big man's smile that told Sebastian that Jarvis knew. He knew that Sebastian's mother still lived even if he didn't quite understand how her necklace had come to be clasped around the throat of a murdered woman in Brighton. Sebastian slipped the Triskelion from his pocket. Just the sight of it stirred within him a well of anger and hurt that was suddenly more than he could bear. He held it for a moment, its smoothly polished stone cool against his palm. What had made his mother change her mind all those years ago in France, he wondered. Why had she decided to give it up to Guinevere after all? No, said Sebastian, returning Jarvis's lying smile with one of his own. But perhaps you can see that it is returned to her. With a flick of his wrist, he tossed the necklace onto the table at the big man's elbow. Then he turned and walked out of the room. Chapter 65 The churchyard of St. Anne's lay peaceful and quiet, a place of wind-tossed trees and dark shadows trembling over tombstones that loomed pale in the moonlight. But near where he knew Guinevere Anglesey to lie, Sebastian could see a glimmer of light. Directing his coachman to pull up, Sebastian threaded his way through the trees. The light was too constant to belong to grave robbers. It was a common enough practice for families to hire a watchman to sit through the night beside the grave of a newly buried loved one. In the depths of a cold winter, it was sometimes necessary to maintain the vigil for months. The heat of summer usually made a body unusable to the surgeons in a week. Only this was no hired guard. The Marquis of Anglesey himself had come to keep watch over the body of his beautiful young wife. He sat beside her tomb in a campaign chair, 
A rug pulled over his lap despite the warmth of the night. A blunderbuss lay across his knees. Devlin here, Sebastian called in a clear, ringing voice. Don't shoot. Devlin? The old man shifted in his chair, his face contorting as he squinted into the darkness. What are you doing here? Sebastian stepped into the circle of light cast by a brass lantern and hunkered down beside the old man's chair. I've something to tell you, he said. And there, beside Guinevere Anglesey's grave, with the night wind soft against his cheek, Sebastian told Guinevere's husband how she had died, and why. When Sebastian had finished, the Marquis sat in silence for some moments, his head bowed, his breath coming slow and heavy. Then he lifted his head to fix Sebastian with a fierce stare. This woman, this Lady Audley, you're certain she's dead? Yes. He nodded. The wind gusted up, shifting the leaves of the oak tree overhead and bringing them the sense of the place, of long grass and decay and death. Do you believe in God? Anglesey asked suddenly, breaking the silence that had fallen between them. Sebastian met the old man's anguished gaze and answered honestly. Not anymore, no. Anglesey sighed. I wish I didn't. If I didn't, I would take this gun and blow Bevan's brains out. It's what I should have done before. Perhaps if you can stay alive long enough, you'll be lucky and someone else will do it for you. Anglesey grunted. The ones who deserve to die rarely do. He stared off across the graveyard to where the moonlight reflected off the high arch windows of the ancient stone church. I was sitting here tonight, wondering what it would have been like if I had been born thirty years later, or if Guinevere had been born thirty years earlier. Do you think she would have loved me? She loved you. I think in the end she came to realize you had given her the one thing no one else in her life ever had. Anglesey shook his head, not understanding. What was that? Your unselfish love. The old man's eyes squeezed nearly shut as if he were wincing at some deep inner pain. I was selfish. If I hadn't been so obsessed with getting an heir, if I hadn't pushed her into that young man's arms again, she never would have died. You can't know that. I may not believe in God, but I've come to believe that there is a pattern, a pattern that works itself out in ways we can't begin to understand. Isn't that just another way of describing God? Perhaps, said Sebastian. He was suddenly very tired. He felt a powerful need to hold Cat in his arms to hold her safe and close forever. Perhaps it is. He came to her in the stillness of the night, when the last carriage had rumbled through the streets, and the moon was only a pale memory on the horizon. Moving restlessly in the unnatural heat of the night, Cat awoke and found Devlin beside her. Marry me, Cat, he said, his hand shaking as he brushed the hair from her sweat-dampened brow. She watched his face in the dying moonlight, watched until the hope began to fade, and the hurt crept in. And when she could bear it no longer, she leaned into him, her forehead pressing against his shoulder, so that she couldn't see his face, and he couldn't see hers. I can't. There's something you don't know about me. Something I've done. I don't care what you've done. He twisted his fingers through her hair, his thumbs slipping under her chin to force her head up. There's nothing you could have done that would make me... She pressed her fingertips to his lips, stopping his words. No, you can't say that when you don't know what it is. And I don't have the courage to tell you. I know I love you, he said, his lips moving against her fingers. Then let that be enough. Please, Sebastian, let that be enough.
Tossing his chapeau bras and gloves on a table in the darkened hall, Jarvis walked into his library, kindled a small branch of candles, and poured himself a glass of brandy. Smiling with satisfaction, he carried the brandy to a chair beside the fire. But after a moment, he set the brandy aside untasted and slipped Lady Hendon's silver and bluestone necklace from his pocket. Threading the chain through his fingers, he held it up to the light, the bluestone disc and its superimposed silver triskelion tracing a slow arc as it swung back and forth through the air. It was all nonsense, of course, the legend that had grown up around the thing. Intellectually, he knew that. And yet it seemed to him that he could feel the pendant's power. Feel it, yet not grasp it. Papa? Looking around, he found his daughter, Hero, standing in the doorway. His fist closed over the pendant, stilling it. Why are you still up? she asked, coming into the room. In the white satin evening gown she'd chosen for the prince's fete, with the soft light of the candles golden on her skin, and her hair crimped around her face, she almost looked pretty. He dropped the necklace onto the table and reached for his glass. I thought I'd have a brandy before going up to bed. Her gaze fell on the necklace beside him. What an interesting piece, she said, reaching to pick it up before he could stop her. She cradled the pendant in her palm. As he watched, her expression slowly altered, her lips parting, her eyebrows twitching together. What? he said more sharply than he'd intended. What is it? Nothing, it's just... She gave a shaky laugh. It sounds ridiculous, but it's almost as if I can feel it growing warm in my hand. She looked up at him. Whose is it? Jarvis drained his glass in one long pull and set it aside. I believe it's yours. Author's Note the Jacobite threat to the Hanoverian dynasty was considered quite real in Georgian England. The Catholic Relief Act of 1778 was contingent upon the swearing of an oath to disavow the Stuarts. But the death in the early 19th century of Henry Stuart, brother of Bonnie Prince Charlie, effectively ended the Stuart dynasty. Their claim passed to the King of Savoy, who was descended from the daughter of Charles I. The Hanoverians traced their descent from a daughter of Charles I's father, James I. This much is history. The Prince of Wales did indeed hold a grand fete in June of 1811 to celebrate the beginning of his regency. It was much as I have described it, although sticklers will note that I have moved its date back to accommodate my story. The Prince Regent's obsession with all things Stuart was also very real, as was his enormous unpopularity. The song Sebastian Hears the Crowd Singing on the Night of the Fete was actually part of a poem written by Charles Lamb in 1812. However, the 1811 conspiracy to replace the Hanovers with the House of Savoy is my invention, as is the existence of a daughter, Anne, married to a Danish prince. The story of the Welsh mistress of James II and her necklace is based in part on the true story of a woman named Goditha Price. She bore Prince James two children, one of whom, Mary Stuart, married a Scottish laird named Macbean. As a wedding present, she received from her royal father her mother's necklace, an ancient piece in the form of a silver triskelion set against a bluestone disc. The necklace is said to grow warm in the hands of the one destined to possess it. It is also said to bring long life. Mary Stuart gave the necklace to her son, Edward Macbean, when his participation in a rising against the Hanoverian dynasty on behalf of his uncle, the Old Pretender, led to his exile. Macbean sailed for America, where he lived to the ripe old age of a hundred and two, and fathered a large family from which the author is descended. The necklace has not, unfortunately, descended along my branch of the family. Its most recent owner, a salty old lady I first met over the internet, died at the age of 103. The End This is Davina Porter. 
We hope you have enjoyed this production of When Gods Die, a Sebastian Sincere Mystery by C.S. Harris. Recording Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.